All right, welcome to our next online event. This is the workshop on dynamic uh, digestion and a combined workshop between the UNGAP network and the InfoGest network. My name is Andre Brodkorb and I'm based in the Chagas Food Research Center here in Famoy in Ireland. We have 11 speakers from around the globe. So our first speaker will be from China, then we go over to Europe and then uh, across the pond to Canada and to we finish off in California. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar, so it's on Zoom, but in, uh, at the same time, we broadcast live on YouTube. And without any further delay, I would like to introduce the head of the UNGAP and InfoGest network, Didier Dupont and Patrick Augustine. 
And I hand over to Patrick straight away and you have some slides to share. Here we go. Okay, so thank you, Andre. So my name is uh, Patrick Augustens. I'm chair of uh, the UNGAP Coast Action and professor in biopharmaceutics of uh, the University of Leuven. So UNGAP is a coast action which focuses on the, the processes which take place related to intestinal drug absorption. And uh, we focus the activities around four working groups. So the first working group on specific patient populations, uh, focusing on uh, pediatrics, geriatrics, uh, bariatric surgery, for instance, in which it too, we have an interest in the regional differences of intestinal drug absorption, here we G3, how advanced formulations behave in the GI tract, and we G4, uh, the food drug interface. The coast action started in 2017 and will last till the end of April. So we are very close to the end of this coast action. Uh, we are at the end of this coast action, which means we have already obtained a lot of achievements, but I will not go into detail uh, because all these uh, achievements have been summarized on one slide, which you can also find on the website of UNGAP. So I would like to refer to the website of UNGAP to um, see what accomplishments obtained over the years. But obviously today we will have a focus, especially on VG4, on the food drug interface, because it's obvious that it's very important that we have an idea what happens with a drug or formulation when you take it with food. It will have a direct effect, an indirect effect. So extremely important that we have an idea about these effects also during drug development. And there it's important that in vitro tools are available to explore this um, or to predict this in vivo behavior of formulations. And then we come very close to the activities of uh, InfoGest. Um, I would like to acknowledge specifically all the efforts which our co lead of VG4, Mirko, has done to sustain these interactions with InfoGest. And uh, related to InfoGest, I would like to give the word to Didier. So, Didier, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, before we start with the uh, very exciting a program of the day, I would like to say a few words about InfoGest, which is the International Network on Food Digestion. Uh, the objective of this network uh, are to develop in vitro, in vivo and in silico digestion models. We want to harmonize the methodologies and propose guidelines for performing new experiments. We want to validate our in vitro models towards in vivo data try to identify the compounds that are released in the gut during food digestion. And we want to determine the effect of the food matrix on the bioavailability of food nutrients and bioactive molecules. So this is how the network looks like at the moment. We are a bit uh, more than 670 scientists from 52 countries, so all the continents are now present. We have a strong involvement of the, of the industry, mainly the food industry, with more than 60 companies following our activities. This is how we are organized. Uh, so we have six working group working in parallel. So if you want to join, feel free to send me an email and I will be more than happy to add your name to one of these working group. And more recently, we have launched uh, six joint working group together with UNGAP. So you can see here the title of the different working groups. And I would like to say a few words on the last one. Uh, because it's a brand new one that uh, has been launched officially today. It's an imaging uh, working group. So if you are interested about MRI, scintigraphy or ultrasonography, please contact either Patrick or myself and we will add your name to this working group. So this is it. Uh, so now let's move on to uh, the program, the exciting program of the day. And I would like to uh, introduce the first speaker of today, Professor Xiao Dong Chen from the University of Sochou in China. Uh, Dong has been working for more than 15 years on the development of dynamic models, and he will today show us uh, his new toy that is very exciting. So Dong, the floor is yours.
André, you're muted. Of course I am, yeah. So uh, we are about 160 people online. Now there's a question and answer box and please type the questions into the question and answer box. And they uh, also mention who this is directed uh, to and uh, all questions will be answered. Okay, here we go. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where, where you are. My name is Dong Chen. Uh, from the School of Chemical and Environmental Engineering at Suzhou University. Today, I will talk about dynamic in vitro stomach intestine systems. Where Suzhou is, uh, Suzhou is uh, uh, not far from Shanghai, so it takes about 20 minutes on high-speed train. Uh, so it's a very convenient place. Suzhou is an ancient city and also uh, uh, Suzhou University is a very old university in the Chinese standard. Suzhou University is ranked number 20 or 21, 21 uh, in the Chinese uh, academic table, and uh, on the Nature Index is number nine in the country. Uh, when I explained, uh, when I explained the uh, the the interest in this area to the industry some years ago. I noticed that uh, it's actually quite easy to separate the food engineering into two parts. One is we may call the food engineering above the neck and uh, second is the below the neck. And it turns out the majority of the industries are uh, focusing on the uh, activities or perceptions or performances above the neck. Okay. Uh, it's very important then to look at what happens below the neck. And of course, the what's going on in the uh, human mouth is very important as well. So when we look at the anatomy of the of human digestion system, and we very quickly from engineering point of view or engineers uh, point point of view, that uh, we notice the the uh, activities uh, uh, similar to the uh, to engineering. And in whatever happened in the mouth and uh, can be shown there, I will not uh, sort of uh, spell it out uh, due to the time constraint. And then you go for go through the esophagus, effectively a, a pipe, but uh, doesn't block. And then you go to this amazing uh, reactor, which is called stomach, and it does various things. And then even more amazing, the uh, the uh, intestinal system, which is almost like one dimensional reactor that goes on for quite long distance. And uh, it does also the uh, the absorption process. And uh, we have various uh, secretion channels, uh, almost like uh, or designed to place at the at the point that we need them. And uh, so they're actually making the the uh, digestion stage wise and uh, nicely. Okay. And then we also notice the various uh, 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 receptors and uh, and various measurement point from engineering point and uh, actually connecting to the uh, brain activity and then also control the activities in the in the uh, GIT and uh, noticing the uh, important anatomy regions such as pylorus and also the connection between small intestine to the uh, to the column section. They are also important. So in fact, the developing any in vitro system that you need to notice this particular important uh, 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 locations and the geometries or say anatomies in general that uh, will make those uh, system more realistic, modified. So uh, for the uh, uh, in vitro systems, that uh, I suggested in the early days that uh, we have to use soft elastic material to build artificial organs that are as similar as possible to the uh, anatomy of the of the animal or, or human of concern. And of course, we have to uh, set the organ in motion so that we have to have a mechanical uh, or, or a mechanical electrical system to drive that. 
And also, of course, important, very importantly, we have to have the biochemical processes with secretions uh, interacting with food and uh, as close as possible. Then it would be ideal to have a, some kind of intelligent control that simulate uh, what our uh, nerve system and controlling the uh, the uh, the secretions and the movement and so on. So the, the ultimate aim is to create a whole human or animal food processing experience for the food inside a GI tract. So this will be the the uh, original aim of the thing. Of course, that has come a long way since 2003. Okay, so our dynamic bionic human devices actually uh, start to, to be effective, to start to show some promise that in 2006, that uh, when I was in the uh, Monash University in Australia, where we made the first uh, with the uh, a PhD student, uh, Jin Yu, at the time that uh, we, we make the first uh, uh, human stomach model, that uh, closely simulated to uh, of the uh, human uh, stomach uh, anatomy. And since then, that we over many, many years, we developed various versions of that, eventually come to a, a current version, which I'll talk more in a, in a moment. And uh, so you can see that uh, here, just as what I explained, that you need to have two uh, major sections. One is about making the, the organ as close as possible to the human anatomy. And also you need to have a, the a mechanical uh, electrical system that controlled uh, uh, by computer and to, to run this uh, uh, system. Of course, you need to have a, a secretions made up uh, beforehand and kept uh, with the system and fed into the system as uh, time actually you need. And it's actually quite interesting that our initial uh, work that were not so recognized and we submit the papers and uh, mostly got rejected and uh, uh, anyway in, in those days. So then we turn our back, turn, turn our focus onto the uh, uh, red stomach because where we can get a lot of in, in vivo data and to compare with, and that become quite successful. So you can see the dates we started from 2008 and developed that uh, over time. And you can see various versions of that to the current version, sec uh, third generation. And they all worked, uh, it has worked very well. It matches about 90 something percent of the in vivo activity. And this is the current model that you can see that is nicely encapsulated in the in the uh, mechanical electronic device and controlled by a computer panel. And you have the secretions delivered. You also have a mechanism which can help emptying the process um, uh, nicely and uh, closer to the in vivo uh, behavior. So uh, into two, starting from 2018 that we have got the, uh, the uh, bionic in vitro human digestive tract model, which uh, uh, high is actually uh, into the fourth generation and now fourth generation plus. So you can basically see that uh, uh, relative to, to man and woman, that uh, the, uh, the size of the machine, and you can take a closer look that you actually see this uh, uh, nice stomach model, and that you have a, a, a basic pH probe inserted. You also have a little camera inserted into that, uh, which works very nicely. You also have this rolling system to provide this uh, uh, movement of the stomach. And of course, you have this uh, uh, well of control acting as a pylorus. Okay, so uh, in 2018, that we actually created this uh, uh, company called the Pro Health Instrument, and that has helped enormously in bring the the uh, first generation of the machine to a, a very uh, a much more operatable system. But you can see that without a, a, a kind of a commercialization that is actually quite difficult to satisfy all these requirements for a dynamic system. And uh, artificial organs, which you need a reasonably high-tech 3D printing that uh, to make this a consistent uh, organ and mechatronics, uh, computer programming, automatic control, secretion storage and delivery, 
and sampling mechanisms and of course uh, solving a lot of blockage issues and uh, some safety issues and machine reliability and of course the uh, consumables. So I just show you briefly as an example that uh, the artificial organs needed in this stomach intestinal system that in fact you can see that actually need to be made quite consistently and repeatedly, uh, repeatedly and uh, so it's, uh, it's actually quite a difficult task. Anyhow, we come to this uh, uh, amazing stage where we can actually uh, use the, the device re uh, nicely, reliably, and where I now show you the, uh, the uh, how they actually work. And you will see this big circle there right behind it. It's actually a very nicely uh, uh, can be programmed so that it will help us to to achieve the kind of uh, emptying which is difficult to 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 do that uh, as kind of a refinement on, uh, in, in addition to the rolling action, which I mentioned about. And you also see this uh, a section of the small intestine uh, that uh, below the stomach, which also worked quite well. And we recently um, uh, modified the, the, the turning, I mean, turning point, the angle of this actually make it not uh, uh, easily blocked, which is uh, quite nice. So the system actually now, uh, without any pump uh, as such, that uh, controlled. Nicely, and when we also have this uh, uh, a, a, a infant system now, which is uh, second generation, where we actually achieve more or less the same as the as adult version, that except this one can actually uh, put inclined, actually inclined to something like zero degree, that because of infants do actually have this uh, 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 requirement uh, because they do lie down. And here I show you the little what the little camera will, will see inside the inside the uh, the stomach, and uh, one is uh, milk, another one is the is a meat as such. So you can see that uh, is actually uh, uh, you can actually observe the the process quite nicely. And then I will, I will demonstrate very quickly, hopefully, the the emptying and sieving process that can be achieved. Um, because not only emptying, you need to have a sieving because the pilots only have a one or uh, maybe two millimeter opening in a normal situation. Here we actually tested on the brown rice and the white rice, where you can actually see that the brown rice uh, is, uh, has a lot more uh, fibrous material actually stay in the stomach a bit longer in, in more lumps, lumpy stage. But, but uh, outside stomach, they're actually quite smooth. And you can see the size actually break down at the one or two millimeters. So it means the saving process work quite well. And then here I just show a cheese emptying experiment and including the what happened in the stomach and also exiting the stomach. And a lot of effort is going into here and you can actually match the expected, the ex emptying process. And uh, of course, there are a lot of efforts put in here and uh, simply because the 
the cheese itself actually is very troublesome to operate. This is a kind of lump that we, we found when we uh, started to contact, uh, first uh, contact, uh, conduct this kind of work. And then that we also developed the bionic mouse and uh, actually developing uh, in recent time, actually working quite well now, again, matching the in vivo uh, system uh, results uh, reasonably well. And uh, in fact, uh, of course, we don't see people so interested in the, the, uh, the anatomy of the inside the, uh, the intestine, but in fact, it can be done that I will just show you some of the morphologies that we could achieve inside here. And this is the system that we have uh, built various versions depending on the needs of the customers. Uh, and we have operated, uh, co cooperated with uh, this many partners and since 2018. And so I may conclude the dynamic in vivo, uh, uh, in vitro um, system for GIT modeling uh, is actually made closer to reality. Reliable bionic systems for human GI tract and animal GI tract are now manufactured with reasonable operability. We uh, haven't seen shown here, which you could have a pig model and also a little doggy and, uh, and a cat. Uh, a lot of valuable insights for food digestion and absorption, in fact, are being obtained through the application of the dynamic in vitro systems. And the bionic models can be further improved depending on the practical needs, uh, like uh, in, in intelligent control of secretion delivery, which has uh, been done, and the detailed texture of the intestines and so on. Okay, and uh, now I, I thank you for listening um, for, the, uh, for my talk. Thank you. Very impressive, very impressive. Don, can you switch on your camera there, please? And we have time for some questions, did you? Yep, I can start with a question uh, from Konstantinos Tamatopoulos. Uh, very interesting question. How do you handle gastric emptying? Is it based on in vivo data or do you reproduce the physiological mechanism where the gastric emptying is controlled by negative feedback mechanism from duodenum? So how do you control gastric emptying in your system, Dong? Can you explain that? Okay. Uh, right now, we only uh, based on the, uh, the, I mean, rather limited in vivo data or in vivo trend that, uh, will, that we will set our emptying curve. And uh, we actually, it's a forward system. So basically actually quite difficult to, to, uh, to make it uh, working at the starting point. But now we get a, a good hand of it using this uh, uh, machine. And we can basically adjust uh, to, uh, in a way that uh, whatever the, the curve that uh, we can actually find in the, in the uh, literature. And so for example, we can have a, a typical meat, meat product one, we can have a typical rice or this and that. Uh, but uh, more recently, we, uh, we, we know that uh, the, the, this operation is not that intelligent as such, but uh, we, we only uh, in very passively following the, the literature that we can find. But uh, more recently, we actually developed a, uh, a, an online or inline the viscometry that actually uh, work quite Are you still there, Dong? I cannot hear you anymore. Okay, that's a pity because we have a lot of questions coming. I don't know if we can... Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Can I right. ask you another question? We, we, we only have a few minutes, sure, sure, but sure. I... Okay, uh, uh, a question from Marco Ramayoli. I was wondering whether you measured the pressure that are rich in the stomach. Did you measure the pressure inside? The stomach? Yes, uh, yes, we can measure the pressure inside the stomach. In fact, we have the uh, very interesting work done on the uh, eating instant noodle, in fact, uh, while drinking uh, Coca-Cola. In fact, that actually uh, make a quite big difference 
that uh, depend on how you drink it. <laughs> That's so. a very practical example, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and, and maybe finally another question: Do you use PVA as a material for your stomach and intestine? What is the the material that you use to for to, to build your organs? All right, we we use this uh, silicone rubber. This uh, uh, you know A plus B type. Uh, originally is from the dragon skin from uh, a Hollywood uh, company because uh, we were thinking that uh, we maybe some stage have uh, kind of a implantable <laughs> a human implant or some some stage. So so anyway, so we have uh, insist on using that, and and we have actually tried tried seventeen different kinds and before, and this one is the best. Okay. Do we still have time for a question or do we move on, André? You're muted. Uh, yeah, I'd say one more, but afterwards all questions can be answered. Uh, yeah. Dong, you can type the uh, answer uh, into the box and then uh, once you answer it, everybody will see the answer. Okay, mm -hmm. but we have one more. Uh, Didier, go ahead. Okay, my question. So <laughs> uh, I know that your system can cover the whole gastrointestinal tract from the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, but it's also, there is also a place for a large intestine. Uh, did you already uh, do some experiments using a, a, a large intestine simulators connecting to, to the whole gastrointestinal tract? Uh, yes, uh, currently the system, are, the two systems are separated physically because the okay. The uh, up to the end of a small intestine, the the resistance time is considerably shorter than the 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 column process. So the column can actually basically stand alone, and uh, so we have a one like uh, we call the large intestine section that are uh, currently uh, working. That uh, uh, the the most important we we try to simulate the movement of that. Of course, with the various um, biochemicals goes on, but we like to see the, the mo actual movement itself make a, a big difference or not, because uh, it turns out to be a, a, a very nice uh, solid state fermentation <laughs> in a way that uh, people have, they haven't seen that before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, um, thank you again, Dong, you can write in the answer. Uh, at the moment, we are just uh, about 200 attendants. Anybody who has a question can type the question into the question and answer box, but please write who the question is destined for, so which speaker, okay? So our next speaker is Annette Müllers from University of Copenhagen, and it's a pre-recorded uh, talk, and we have live question and answers afterwards. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining this uh, workshop on uh, digestion models. And also, I want to thank the COST uh, uh, InfoGest and the COST ONGAP to organize this interesting uh, workshop. And also for inviting me to talk about the dynamic gastric model, which is a model simulating the gastrointestinal tract based at Bioneer in Denmark. And um, uh, First of all, Bioneer is a specialty CRO who offers services within different areas. And um, one of them that you can see down here is predictive organ models. And in this case, this is our new dynamic gastric model that we recently uh, produced uh, based on the old model that comes from the Institute of Food Research at, uh, at in, uh, in Norwich in, in the UK. So we basically have taken it over to use for CRO, CRO with services and also for uh, development of uh, models that, that are suitable for pharmaceutical research. So the, the DGM is, um, is uh, depicted here and here. And what I'm going to talk about is to use this model and its duodenal module for predicting dosage form behavior in the gastrointestinal tract. So first, I'm going to talk a bit about the physiology of the, of the human stomach. I'm going to talk about the DGM, it's the duodenal module, and then in the end, a few cases of, of how, how it works. Uh, 
So the stomach is um, <clears throat> can be divided into three anatomical regions or two functional regions. And it is, in fact, the two functional regions that, that we're simulating in, um, in, in the DGM. The storage, the body and the fundus, where food is entering to from the esophagus, here it's being stored. Um, and then slowly being digested by enzymes secreted from the uh, gastric wall and also the gastric acid that also comes from here. And then slowly being uh, let down into the antrum where the peristalsis and um, physical mixing is taking place. And then it is uh, ejected in a controlled way into the intestine through the pylorus down here. Another thing that's also simulated in the DGM is in fact this uh, the secretion of the gastric acid from the uh, from the from, from the gastric wall. This is a beautiful study from Luca Marziani uh, from 2001, and here you see an MRI a scan of a, of a person from above with a meal in the stomach. And when you uh, put a pH gradient on this, you can see that the pH there is a pH gradient in the digesting meal where you have a lower pH at the at the sides so or the linings of the of the stomach, because that's where the gastric acid comes from, obviously. And there's not a lot of homogenization or, or mixing in, in this part, in the fundus part of the of the stomach. But after a while, of course, then the stomach, uh, then the pH uh, in the whole stomach is gonna go to a to a to a lower pH, to a lower value. So that's um, what we are trying to simulate, and we simulate that by adding the gastric acid and the enzyme separately up here at the top of the DGM, sort of around the rim of, of the of the of the funnel. Then we have this part up here, the funnel, which is simulating the the fundus and the body, that is surrounded by a body of water that is uh, maintaining this part at, at 37 degrees. And here we only have we have a gentle massaging by the pressure water pressure in the in this um, in this compartment up here so there's a gentle massaging simulating what happens in 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 the stomach then the food goes into the to the piston and barrel down here which is simulating the pressure and homogenization that you find in 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 the antrum after digestion and homogenization the in a way that is physiologically relevant the food comes out here through the through the uh, this hole which is simulating the py pylorus and what we then do from there is um, is that we can then, if that is relevant, we incubate in a duodenal module where we are uh, simulating the digestion in, in the small intestine or the, mainly the duodenum, you can say. So here we also maintain this at 37 degrees and we add um, bile extra concentrated bile extract and, and also lecithin in order to achieve the bile salt values that we know is relevant for, for uh, the human gastrointestinal tract. We also add pancreatin. Uh, also, porcine pancreatin to especially have the lipases and proteases that are important for the digestion of, of the meal. Uh, we can run the DGM in two different conditions, or in reality, anything in between this. Uh, in the fasted state setup, we um, uh, we we uh, we always we add a gastric acid primer, simulating the whatever is uh, is present in the stomach in the fasted state. So, like 40 milliliters, 40 50 milliliters of a gastric prime acid priming solution at a at a low pH. Then we add 240 milliliters of tap water and the dosage form like it is recommended for the, the carrying out of, of clinical studies by, by the FDA to do. After we do that, then we start the dynamic addition of the acid and enzyme solution. And this runtime is a, a runtime of a fasted state study is around uh, 30 minutes. In the fat state, we can, for example, add the, um, the, the, the FDA breakfast, but the study starts as in the fasted state that we have a gastric acid, uh, acid priming solution. We then add the chewed meal. And here we can either actually physically chew the meal, or we also recently developed a, a method where we're grinding the meal and adding uh, amylase and artificial saliva. And then that way making it, uh, giving it the same consistency and, and properties of an actually chewed meal. And we especially found in that process that the amylase is super important because it actually starts digestion of carbohydrates so starts very, very fast and it's a very efficient enzyme. Then we uh, start at the addition of uh, 
acid and enzyme solution. In the 30 minutes, like in the guidance from the FDA, we add 240 milliliters of tap water and the dosage form. And this runs for approximately four, uh, four hours. And for both of these setups, the acid solution is added as a function of the measured pH in the, in, um, in, in the fundus. And the enzyme solution is added as a function of the volume or the calories of the meal present in, uh, in the GGM. So just to show you an example of this FDA breakfast that the, the FDA uh, recommend for um, uh, for evaluating the, the food effect or, uh, or also for fed, fed, fed bioequivalent fed state bioequivalent studies on, on drug products on drugs then uh, this is a, an example of, uh, of such a meal and, and the composition of it so it's rather a substantial meal. But it uh, it can be digested by by the DGM. If we then look at the characteristics of the DGM, first of all the pH profile. Here in the fasted state, the black curve is from a, a study from Carmanolis, and here you see that they they have measured the, the pH in the in the stomach after ingestion of a glass of water, and as you can see, the red curve, the DGM, is simulating that to a quite good degree. The same is here when we are ingesting the FDA uh, breakfast. Uh, the box plots here are the pH of the different individuals in the in the stomach, and also here you see that the pH profile of the DGM after during digestion of the FDA breakfast simulates pretty well what's happening in vivo. Uh, if you then look at the emptying profile, which of course is also important in this context, then you also see that uh, the emptying profile, the red curve here, is simulating uh, of the DGM is simulating pretty well the, the black curves here of the of the clinical study by Moody et al. If you then look at this uh, the, in the fat state, then again the black uh, stipulated lines here are from are from uh, Mirku study in 2014, and also here you see you see the ingestion of the of the um, uh, of the meal in the in the DGM. You see that initial digestion, then the intake of the 240 milliliters of water. Oops, and then the digestion or the emptying is continuing basically in the say with the same rate as in the in in um, in in the humans. We had to modify it a little in order to accommodate the time it takes uh, to get the models up and running, and therefore we we have chosen to end the, the experiment at four hours, which also in our experience doesn't really play a big role for for the for the data that comes out of the, the model. So all in all, the DGM and the Stuartnell module is characterized by having a high degree of flexibility and as I'll show you in a minute, also predictability of what, uh, how, how, um, what is happening to, to, uh, to dosage forms in, in, um, in both the fed and fasted state. First of all, it can digest an entire meal. And that could be uh, the FDA breakfast, but in reality, it can be any kind of meal. We can cu customize the uh, emptying uh, of the stomach according to the nature of the uh, of the ingested meals, the calories, and so. We can sample in the fundus if desires. Otherwise, we de we sample from what is injected through the uh, uh, through the pylorus of the GGM. Uh, we can simulate whatever pH profiles that we are interested in. So we can simulate. Uh, ingestion of proton pump inhibitors that will increase the pH in that way. Uh, so that we can also have an influence on, on different drug products. We do measure the pH online in the funder, so we know exactly what the pH is there. We have a flexible uh, enzyme addition, both with regard to activity and, uh, and kind. And obviously we can add both what we want in the DGM and also in the dot duodenal module with regard to, uh, to enzymes. We can also simulate different uh, special populations, for example, pediatric patients, and we can also simulate animal stocks, for example. Uh, and then also we usually uh, incubate uh, the, the samples in the duodenal module, but that's more or less an optional thing if you're interested in only what happens in the stomach or you also want to combine it in, with the duodenal model, depending on what is relevant. So a few cases here. 
Um, this is a study where we've been uh, predicting the, the actual the negative food effect of diclofenac potassium or cataflam in, uh, in the DGM. And here you see, uh, first of all, the gastric dissolution, meaning how much drug is in solution when it comes out of the dynamic gastric model. As I told you before, the fasted state study only lasts for 30 minutes, and that's why we only have data for, for 30 minutes, whereas the fed state study is lasting for, for four hours. So all in all, you can see that in the fasted state, we have much more drug going in solution. All these samples are then uh, transferred to the duodenal, mod, duodenal digestion model. And, and here you can see the, the, the amount of drug that is actually just being dissolved during the, 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 um, uh, the fasted state. And the red curve here is what is happening in the fed state of the of the uh, dynamic gastric, uh, of the duodenal uh, digestion. And basically we take out samples, they're centrifuge, and we decide how much drug is in, in solution. Then we uh, found a clinical study uh, on diclofenac where we could find uh, the volume of distribution, the plasma half-life, the oral bioavailability. And by using that, we could do a duodenal dissolution convolution, uh, basically based on these curves. And that way we could we can uh, uh, predict the, the plasma profiles, which are the stipulated lines in this graph, whereas the DDM data uh, from the deconvolution of the duodenal data here uh, are the solid lines. And as you can see, we do find a pretty good uh, correlation be between the two. Another example, which is of a of, well, positive or no food effect of a, of a modified release uh, formulation of uh, Mucinex, uh, of which of the drug guaifenesine. We basically uh, uh, will also here see the the the, end, the uh, what's called the fasted state dissolution profile, the fed state dissolution profile, and then uh, all these samples go straight into the duodenal module. And here you see how much drug has actually gone in solution. Here. Here. And using the, uh, the, the, the data from, from this paper, then we could again do a duodenal dissolution convolution of the, of the data here of how much drug is in solution. And that actually also ended up predicting what happens um, in how the plasma profiles look that, that simulated that very well also. So in that way, you can say that, that we can, we can uh, use the dynamic gastric model model and its duodenal module to simulate a uh, food effect on uh, different drug products. But obviously we can, it is also usable for a lot of other things like bioequivalence studies. In general, does it form behavior? Does the does it form sink? Does it float? When does it start to disintegrate and so on? We do have to been doing studies on modified release uh, matrix entering matrix does it forms entry coded and so on, and actually also in gastric retensive systems where you can see how long the different system can stay in, in the GI tract. And then, as I said, we can also simulate the GI conditions uh, of the infants or of other patient group to the degree, of course, that we know about the, the, the specifications or the conditions in the GI tract of these special populations. So that was basically what I wanted to say. So thank you for your attention and um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, so thank you, Annette, uh, for this uh, presentation of the DGM. Uh, so, firstly, we have uh, one question in the Q&A. So, um, thank you, intrigued by the use of lecithin in the model, presumably to act as a physiological emulsifier. We also use lecithin in the gastric phase. My team often struggles with analysis of pure oils in static models. Typically, we emulsify by spiking a mixed meal or infant formula with the oil. Any comment? Well, I mean, first of all, the, 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 um, the gastric fluid has a certain, has a, what's called a surface tension that's lower than water. So in that way, that there is a need for some sort of surfactant in in the gastric uh, in the in the gastric media, and we do sometimes use uh, phospholipid for that, depending on how it all what kind of project we're working on. As for the intestinal media, 
then uh, we are having the same uh, phospholipid content as is in the, the human intestinal fluids. The reason we added specifically here is that in the porcine uh, uh, bile extract, which is a mixture of bile, bile salts from, 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 uh, from porcine, then uh, from pigs, then uh, uh, in that case, we uh, in that process of uh, making the bile, bile, bile salt extract, then you don't extract the phospholipid. So therefore we have to add the phospholipid extra in that case. I'm not sure if that answered the question. I might come in there. I think the question also refers to you know how 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 you put um, the active component of food into a system. So in the food digestion network, we keep going on about we don't consume oil, but we consume food. So if you want to test oil, then you have to incorporate it into food because we eat food. Of course, slightly different for drugs. You know, the, the outlook is different, but in the food uh, food world, if you want to test food oil, you have to incorporate it into food, meaning emulsify it. Yeah. Uh, yes, that, that is true, but, but uh, I mean, usually we also, well, when we work with food, it's often the, diet, the FDA breakfast, even that we can work with other kinds of foods also. Anyway, it has been shown then that, that phospholipids are released from the gastric mucosa, so you have a lot of phospholipids produced by the gastric wall. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that way, it, it will make sense because there are solubilization capacity in the gastric fluids, for sure. And also in the small in the small intestine, but I mean also if you are interested in looking at a digestion of oils as such, then they will be digested by the enzymes, the gastric lipase and the and the and the pancreatic lipases. So in that way, and when the oil is digested, it becomes increasingly water soluble. Okay, Andrea, I don't know whether we still have uh, time for an additional question. I think we have a yeah, for a small question, because there are a couple of other questions. Whatever question is unanswered, the uh, presenters will type the answer. And once you type it and press OK, all the attendants will see the question and the answer. OK, maybe a yeah. short one. So we still have a short question, maybe a short answer then as well. So uh, but, uh, how do you test floating dosage forms? Do you use sinkers of any kind? Well, we will always try to to carry out the studies as close to the, to the corresponding clinical study. And usually you will not use a sinker in a floating dosage form. So part of the observation that you can make in the DTM is that this particular tablet or capsule or whatever it is, is actually floating in the stomach. And that's obviously gonna play a role in how the drug is, uh, is released from, from that dosage form. Yeah. Okay, but uh, there are still a couple of other questions, but uh, this will be answered then in the Q&A. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank, thank you, Annette. So, our next speaker, we are right on time now, is from uh, University of Clermont-Ferrand. That's Stephanie blanquet dio on the artificial uh, colon. Stephanie, can you um, share your screen and switch on your camera, please? Stephanie, and it's a live, live talk, so you better be there. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me? Super, yeah. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, so I am Stephanie Blanquedio, I am Associate Professor at uh, Clermont Auvergne University, which is located in uh, Clermont-Ferrand in the center of uh, France. And I'm going to talk about uh, the mucosal artificial colon, uh, so m -arcol. Stephanie, can uh, you share your screen, please? Sorry? We, can you share your screen? Because we don't see your screen yet. Ah, sorry. Is it is it okay now? Is it okay? Yes. 
it's, you, it's okay. Yes, can you can you put it in a presentation mode, maybe? Yes, yes, of course. Sorry. Okay, great, thanks. Okay. Yeah, perfect. So maybe uh, <laughs> I would just uh, start again. So I was saying that uh, I am from the Université Clermont Auvergne, so in Clermont-Ferrand, in the center of France, and I'm going to talk about mucosal artificial colon, so MR col. Uh, so MRCOL is a part of our in vitro gut simulation platform called Digest EV, which gather different dynamic and multi-compartimental in vitro models that are simulating the entire uh, human or, digest, uh, or animal digestive tract. So on our platform, we have uh, uh, very briefly two TIM1, uh, another gastric and small intestinal model, which is called uh, ESIN for engineer stomach and small intestine. Uh, that my colleague Sylvain Denis is going to present uh, later in the afternoon, and MR call that I am going to, uh, to introduce uh, briefly to you. Uh, so just, uh, we also have a showing simulator that can be uh, uh, combined with uh, ESIN models, and also intestinal epithelial models that can be combined to both uh, gastric, small intestinal, and colonic models. Uh, so to explain you how MRCOL is working, so MRCOL looks like uh, a bioreactor, as you can see on the picture. Uh, the model is inoculated with fecal samples from human or animals to introduce the resident microbiota. So we are using MRCOL based on continuous fermentation process. So it means that we are, uh, are regularly introducing a nutritive medium inside the bioreactor that is reproducing the composition of ILA effluent. And we are regularly removing fermentation medium to simulate stool excretion. So based on this input and output of medium, we can reproduce the accurate colonic transit time. We of course control in the um, bioreactor, the body temperature and the colonic pH and we can also measure, but not control, redox potential. Uh, compared to the other uh, colonic in vitro models, a main feature of the HEMAR call is to maintain anaerobiosis by the sole activity of microbiota inside the bioreactor. It means that we do not flush with gas, such as carbon dioxide or nitrogen. A recent optimization of these models have been made in partnership with Tom Van de Ville from Ghent University to distinguish colonic microenvironment. So the luminal phases is inside the bioreactor and the mucosal compartment is simulated um, by a mucin bead, an external mucin bead compartment that is connected to the main bioreactor. So we can reproduce the specific mucus associated microbiota. So I have written here the main advantages of MRCOL, especially uh, compared in comparison to other colonic in vitro models. So we can inoculate MRCOL with a stool from different donors. And that is very important because we can reproduce inter-individual variability between uh, people in gut microbiota. Second point, as mentioned just before, we do not flush. So first, it's more physiological, of course, but we can also measure possible change in atmospheric gas composition followed to addition of a drug or nutrient inside the bioreactor. We can also reproduce uh, different colonic microenvironments, so lumen versus mucus-associated microbiota, as already done in the m shine. And lastly, we can uh, reproduce either acute or chronic exposure with different food or drug compound because the experiments can last up to four to six weeks. So on this slide, the main drawback. So of course, there is only in these models uh, the colon. So we are not simulating the upper gastrointestinal tract before with these models. Uh, we have not yet also fully validated these models to, uh, in a three-stage configuration in order to reproduce the three parts of the human colon. Uh, as you have seen, there is also no host compartment in the model. 
even if we can associate this model with intestinal epithelial cells in culture. And lastly, uh, compared to other colonic models, experiments can uh, last only four to six weeks, but it's quite a long time uh, nevertheless. So these models has been recently adapted to different age conditions. So we can mimic the adult condition or the infant condition. We have also adapted the model to uh, simulate different diets. So it means normal diet versus Western diets. And very recently we have adapted it to reproduce some pathology, some disease associated with gut microbiota perturbation and we have done a model of obesity and a model of uh, irritable bowel syndrome. So what are the applications of these models? So what is interesting is that with Hemarcol, you can study the bidirectional relationship between gut microbiota and any nutrient or drug that then can arrive into the colon. So regarding the nutrient or drug, you can follow the kinetic of release, for example, from a food matrix or from an oral formulation. You can after follow the bioaccessibility of the drug or the nutrient or its metabolism by gut microbiota. On the side of gut microbiota, you can follow the effect of the nutrient or the drug on the composition of gut microbiota, but also its metabolic activity or uh, follow some functional gen of interest. Uh, so I will now develop two uh, examples, one in the field of food and uh, at the end of my presentation in the field of pharma. So as previously mentioned, we have recently developed a model to reproduce uh, the colon of obese patients. So we have first adapted all the physical chemical parameters of the model to the specific digestive environment of obese patients. So we have done for this purpose a very huge uh, literature. Uh, we have written more than 200 articles to select the 15 most relevant to set up the models. So you can see here uh, which parameters have been changed between uh, LC models and, uh, and obese models. So the temperature is of course unchanged, just like the residence time, but we have decreased the pH and we have largely adapted the nutritive medium uh, because we are, uh, the aim was to reproduce a diet induced obesity. So we have then performed experiments so we MRCOL, two bioreactors were run in parallel, one under LC condition, the other on uh, the other under obese condition. So these experiments have been done four times uh, with the fecal samples from four LC donors, two male and two females. So after stabilization, we have collected samples both from the atmospheric phases, mucosal phases and luminal phases to analyze microbiota composition, and but also microbiota activity by following gas and short chain fatty acid. So here are some of our results. So these graphs are showing bacterial relative abundances depending on the donor. So you can see the four donors here, and you have here the results for the luminal phases, and you have here the results for the mucosal phases. Here, uh, <laughs> for LC parameters and here for uh, obese parameters. So what you can see is it's that applying obese parameters led to a clear shift in microbial profile, as you can see here. But what is very interesting is that if we are focusing on Akkermansia, which is a population marker of obesity, you can see that, so you see it very clearly for the donor four, but it's true also for three out of the four donors. So Ackermansia is clearly decreasing from the luminal and mucosal phases when, when you are shifting from LC to obese parameters. So if you are doing more in-depth analysis with differential analysis, you can see here on this graph that in the luminal phases, 
shifting from LC to obese parameters led to a significant decrease by 30 of Ackermansia population and in the mucosal phases, sorry, by nine between LC and obese condition. So that is clearly in linked with in vivo data showed by many publications that Ackermansia mucinifila is disappearing in the fecal samples of obese uh, patients in vivo. So we have also followed uh, microbial diversity. So here you have LC data, obese data, and we have two markers of alpha diversity, observed ISV and Shannon indexes. And you can see that in both luminol and mucosal phases, we see a clear decrease in diversity associated to the shift from LC to obese condition. And again, this is strongly in accordance with in vivo data. So I have shown to you the example of Ackermansia, but we have measured, of course, plenty of other population. And you can see them here, a part of them in this table. So you have both bacteria, but also methanogenic archaea. And as you can see here, so here there is 21 population and 15, uh, 14, sorry, population out of, uh, of these 21 are clearly changing according to in vivo data. So it's the case you can see in green. And only two population over the 21 measured showed opposite trends between in vitro and in vivo data. So we can clearly see uh, that we have very good correlation with in vivo data with this application. So last slide for these models on the microbial activity. So we also measured microbial activity uh, through the measure of gas volume, short chain fatty acid concentration and associated energy. And you can see that for these three parameters, we see a clear increase uh, of them uh, between LC to obese condition. And again, this is in accordance with in vivo data. So a short table here that we have also made for in vitro in vivo correlation. So you have here short chain fatty acid concentration, here short chain fatty acid ratio. And again, the green cases are uh, the correlations that are good between in vitro and in vivo data. Stephanie, two minutes yes. left. Yes, I will quickly finish with a pharma application. <laughs> Uh, so I have chosen to, to present you uh, a publication on uh, uh, fecal microbiota transplantation. So very briefly, uh, we run uh, uh, five bioreactors in parallel and do the experiments three times, so with three fecal samples. So the first bioreactor, there was no treatment, and in all the other, we, uh, we induce a perturbation of gut microbiota with antibiotherapy. Then after we added a restoration with fecal microbiota transplantation. So in bioreactor three and four, we had enema, which is a classical form of FMT. And in the last one capsule, uh, which is a new oral formulation for FMT. We follow microbiota composition and activity. And I have only a single graph to show you to finish my presentation. So you can see here, we have analyzed in the uh, bioreactor the total number of dysbiotic days, so days where the microbiota was uh, perturbated, cumulated for the free donors. And you can see here that our index of dysbiosis was based, bon, uh, bo, based both on the composition of microbiota, but also all the markers of metabolic activity. So you can see the first bar. So for the first bar, it's the higher number of this biotic day is only the antibiotic control. The second and third bar are the bar obtained for enema, so classical formulation or FMT. And you can see here the greatest effect because it's a lower number of this biotic day. And to finish, the new oral formulation given by our uh, industrial partner here, we, where we can see almost the same effect than those observed with uh, enema. So I have finished. I just would like to thank uh, all the collaborators, uh, industrial partners and also academic partners. And thanks to you. I hope I was not too long. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for the nice presentation. I think it was very clear and you really stick to the recommendation. So that was perfect. We, we have uh, already a lot of questions. I will start with the first one. Uh, how, long, how long does it take to uh, get the population stabilized in uh, your system? So when you feed the system with fecal material, how long do you have to wait in order to reach the equilibrium? Uh, yes, so it depends, in fact, on the, um, on the kind of application. For example, if it's infant digestion or if it's, it's adult digestion. But in general, it's, uh, I can say, eight to nine days to stabilize to nine the microbiota. Days. Okay. Yes. Okay, okay. And, sorry. Yeah, please go yeah. ahead. <laughs> no, mm. I just would like to say that it's the time allowed for microbiota to shift from in vivo to in vitro, but also to shift from fecal profile to colonic profile, because it's colonic profile that we want to have in the MR call model. Okay, I think that you're introducing the next uh, question. Uh, how representative is the model microbiome to that of the inoculating donor microbiome? So mm. is there an adaptation, how close they are? Yes, of course there is an adaptation because you cannot have in any model exactly what you have in vivo. But in that case, we do not want uh, to have exactly the same thing because we are starting from a fecal inoculum and we want uh, during the stabilization because we are reproducing a colonic that we want a clear shift to colonic microbiota. So we know that we are losing diversity. We cannot keep inside the in vitro models all the spaces that are in the fecal samples, but um, we are quite good uh, regarding uh, the representation. At the film level, it's perfect, can say, almost perfect. When we are going to uh, lower taxonomic levels, so family and genera and species, of course, it's more difficult. Okay, another question. Just wondering how the volume of mucus available to the bacteria in this model compares to the in vivo concentrations. Do you have mm. mucus in the model? Yes, we have just added mucus uh, in an external models to reproduce the uh, uh, microenvironment found at the uh, vicinity of uh, the epithelial cells. Uh, the volume, so, so what is difficult is uh, that we do not clearly have uh, in vivo data giving the volumes of uh, mucus in vivo. But we have done thanks to um, our collaboration with Ghent University because our um, adaptation of the models is based on what is done in the M shine, so mucosal shine. So we have done with Tom van de Ville a calculation to be as close as possible at the in vivo data. We have maybe time for one quick question. I will have uh, how the fecal samples are collected and stored, and how long uh, are the samples stored prior to inoculation? Uh, so what we are doing with MRPOL if, um, is that uh, as, as we can, we are, um, uh, we are working with uh, fresh fecal samples. We do not like working with frozen fecal samples, but sometimes we did not have the choice. So when we are collecting uh, fecal samples, we immediately keep them uh, in, under anaerobiosis, and we are treating the fecal samples if possible uh, before, uh, in the six hours after the, the donation. <laughs> so no more than 12 hours uh, after fecal donation. Great. No more details, please. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Stephanie. It was great. Thank you. You're welcome. Excellent. Thank you, Stephanie. Right on time as well. Uh, so our next speaker is Suzanne Bellman from the Tim Company. And uh, Suzanne will uh, introduce the TNO gastrointestinal model that Tim model. Over to you, Suzanne. Thank you very much, Andre. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay, wonderful. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this exciting webinar where worldwide all the systems are online. I, I think this is the first time this occurred or that I'm aware of. So really, really fantastic. Thank you very much everyone for joining and I will skip uh, just right into the presentation. 
um, to start with, and just as the other models that presented previously and will present, the TIM systems are uh, computer controlled in vitro systems, which simulate uh, the luminal conditions of the upper and lower intestinal tract. Um, we use them just as previously also mentioned for the other systems for nutritional digestion studies, but also for pharmaceutical applications where we use it to test uh, candidate formulations and then help to de-risk human intervention trials uh, while um, predicting high uh, profile or high uh, potential candidates which have the best chance to move forward into clinical studies. Uh, doing this and using the TIM systems, which are more predictive than also animals, um, we also are very proud to contribute actually to the reduction of animals and for farmers, specifically dogs, uh, for the testing of formulations. Uh, here you can see the three types of the systems that we have in our labs, which is the TIM-1 system. I will go into detail a little bit later having uh, the stomach and the three parts of the small intestine. Next to it is our most recent addition to the Tim family. We call it the tiny Tim. It's not meaning that this is a smaller version, but it is a more simplified version, uh, also simulating the upper GI tract. And last, uh, the third system uh, simulating the uh, human or animal colon conditions. I will first focus uh, a little bit of the up, on the upper GI tract systems um, and later in my presentation on the TIM2, while also giving some uh, recent examples of research that's been done with the systems. Sorry, I to slide back. Um, to start with uh, the TIM1 system, which you can see here in the cartoon, consists of a horizontal stomach and the three parts of the small intestine. In the stomach, we secrete uh, saliva, a gastric enzymes consisting of um, pepsin and light gastric lipase, um, but also we simulate um, swallowing of amylase. And very importantly, the gastric emptying over time, I will uh, say a few words on that in one of the next slides. Then after gradual gastric emptying, depending on the type of meal that we administer, the food bolus or the formulation would reach the duodenum where we secrete uh, pancreatic juices, bile and bicarbonates. And the lower units, the unum and ilium are important because they are connected to um, specific membranes that allow the removal of the digested fraction from the, um, from the compartments. And ultimately, the sampling of what we call the bioaccessible fraction, so the fraction that is available for absorption, that's the same as what would reach our gut wall and would be ready uh, for being absorbed. Last, uh, the ileal effluent um, is the non-digested material that would then be gradually forwarded to the large intestine if we wanted to conduct a combination study of the upper and the lower GI tract. Um, as you can see in the schematic, we also simulate uh, peristalsis, which is um, enabled by glass uh, compartments, which are filled with water. And in that there is a flexible uh, luminal sleeve, uh, which is then compressed by water in an alternating way, resulting in the peristalsis that you see here. The tiny TIM system very briefly is a little bit um, simpler than the TIM1 system because the uh, three parts of the small intestine are combined into one part, which mimics average small intestinal conditions. However, we have equipped it with um, a more physiologically J-shaped gastric compartment, uh, which is a higher degree of the physiological situation. And uh, in one of the previous presentations, we heard about the different sections of the stomach. And while the uh, body is more of a storage function, the, the antrum is where the actual uh, grinding and peristalsis take place. That's what we also intend to mimic with this uh, gastric compartment. 
and also here a membrane connected to the small intestinal compartment that removes the digested fraction, which is very important actually in order to maintain a physiological environment in the lumen, allowing all the enzymes to be active as they should. Um, perhaps a small slide or a few words about certain aspects of dynamic uh, simulation. I already mentioned that gastric emptying, uh, transit time and pHs are varying over the course of the GI passage. And for example, gastric emptying is determined by uh, viscosity, particle size, but also and perhaps most dominantly uh, caloric density. Um, which is represented by um, a study done by Halawi in 2017, who measured a huge number of meals and uh, related this to gastric emptying time. So that means a high caloric meal empties low, slower than a fast, uh, than a low caloric meal. Uh, in Tim, we simulate, uh, for example, the two extremes of it, which is fasting and fat state conditions. So you can imagine a fasting state with just a glass of water and a tablet um, does not have any caloric density. So the stomach would empty really quickly with the gastric emptying half time of about 10 to 15 minutes and perhaps even faster. While the FDA recommended high fat meal um, empties very, very slow because it is high caloric and, and everything in between that you can imagine. So what we use currently, um, we have developed an algorithm that translates a caloric density in line with the gastric emptying, a less of curve to very meal specific gastric emptying times. Uh, related to that is also um, very important the pH values. As we all know, meals have different buffering properties um, as you name it, yogurt versus, you know, just a cookie. And in relation to that, also the gastric pHs and small intestinal pHs subsequently vary and change with the meal. That brings me to an application example of a study that has been uh, recently performed by our colleagues in uh, of the University of Guelph in Canada, um, <clears throat> who compared, <coughs> excuse me, who compared static uh, digestion uh, by applying actually the InfoGest static method with two different pHs and the TIM dynamic digestion with a dynamic pH simulation according to a meal. And then they digested um, apples and milk and looked at the fat digestibility um, or in, in the two methods or systems. And as interestingly that um, with the static method, there is no difference in lip lipolysis shown um, on either pH while a dynamic digestion method, as used the Tim here, does show that um, apples in this case do impact the bioaccessibility of lipids. The authors uh, leave it open which of the two is um, predictive for the in vivo situation. Uh, however, I think the point that was made here is that whatever method or model you use, the outcome will always be something and might be different, but it is important to then also interpret the data correctly um, and see what we what we do with the data. It has been shown that um, fibers impact uh, digestibility and absorption of nutrients because they have an impact on enzymes sometimes or they trap certain um, nutrients. So it could well be probable that digestibility um, with or without added fibers in apples in this case is different um, when it is used separately or together. Another example, and I added this slide for the pharmaceutical um, fans listening to this joint, joint um, undertaking of ANGAP and InfoGest, another example of comparison of static and dynamic um, digestion is comparing the dynamic dissolution or digestion in TIM to 
more semi-dynamic or static dissolution. In this case, in this example of a publication in 2020, we compared different formulations, immediate release, extended release, um, tablets and pellets, so different types of formulations uh, with dissolution data gathered at different sites. And we found a very nice correlation with the in vivo uh, ranking that was um, drawn up for the different formulations that we tested. And that brings me to another aspect, which I believe is also important and which I know that the InfoGest static method um, people worked on a lot, which is uh, reproducibility. Uh, this example also shows that different sites and different, yeah, even though the method is very well described, it is sometimes difficult to get reproducible data, even though using exactly the same method, same media, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In the last part of my presentation, I would like to spend a few words on the TIM2 system, the colon system, um, which you see in the next slide in a schematic view again. Um, this is one unit which is inoculated with fecal material. Um, just as the previous presenters also correctly mentioned, we also use uh, fecal material, so originating from the colon, because simply that's the only material we can reasonably access. Uh, the system, just as all the other systems, also simulates body temperature, has an anaerobic environment to allow uh, specific bacteria types to grow. We, we, we have also a peristaltics uh, involved in the system, allowing mixing of substrate and uh, the microbiota appropriately. Uh, the microbiota we use is, is quite dense and resembles almost the density that we find in humans, 10 to the 10th or 10 to the 11th, 12th. And we have the possibility to feed either a standardized allele effluent medium or the material that comes out of the TIM1 effluent to this system. What I find very important is that uh, we use also a membrane system in the TIM2 system. The membrane allows the, the withdrawal or the removal of all the metabolites are formed. And perhaps even more important than in the upper GI tract, it is here so that uh, we differentiate um, from a batch fermentation system where metabolites are eventually piling up and resulting into a shift in microbial composition towards the artificial situation rather than the physiological situation that we actually aim to mimic. Suzanne, one more minute. Yeah. Yes, and that's perfect because I have a last slide here. Um, the, the question that we always also get is whether um, fecal material should be pooled or not pooled. We have investigated that and, and whether we pool and generate an additional individual or whether we do not pool and use individual material, uh, the metabolic activity remains the same, which is also in line with literature. So thank you very much for your attention. And here you see, I wanted to mention this as a last slide, we have recently moved to a brand new uh, facility in the Netherlands, which we opened uh, two weeks ago. And, and we are happy to welcome you if you are in the Netherlands as travel is possible again. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Suzanne, for a very clear presentation. Uh, we have uh, several questions in the Q&A. So first question from uh, Isabel Menfield. Uh, what source of gastric lipase do you use? What source of what? Sorry. Gastric lipase. Oh yeah. yeah, we use a fungal gastric lipase. Um, yes. I know that there is human gastric lipase around, but it's at the moment too expensive for, for us to use. Okay, another question which we have already encountered previously is, uh, but uh, which is also uh, applicable in this system is, uh, have you measured the pressure applied on a dosage form? Yes, yes we have. 
Um, and actually, so, so the pressure that we apply in the advanced gastric compartment has been uh, adjusted and validated by use of the smart pill. So, so that's how we, on the one hand, adjusted our pressure profile, but also validated some them so that the pressure is within the physiological range, which also includes actually the housekeeper wave, which are these strong contractions to empty the stomach at, at night or after a meal. Okay, so thank you. Another question which uh, already appeared uh, this afternoon is uh, how test how testing floating dosage forms in the team? Just as they are. So that's a that's a very good question because especially with the advanced gastric compartment which has this J shape, uh, we see whether formulations precipitate or float. And you know, the same happens also to oils and lipids that disintegrate from the meal, they also start floating. And, and, and for formulators, this is very important to see how their formulations behave. And if they float, they would float and they would disintegrate either into the lipid layer that also floats or, or and would empty last from the stomach. So that does impact the release and the availability of these APIs or pharmaceutical compounds which come out of the formulation. So yes, we have evaluated them and it is very interesting to see how differently they behave in terms of bioaccessible fraction later on, simply because the initial gastric emptying is different. Okay, and the next question relates to the positioning of the stomach and more uh, specifically that the horizontal stomach in the TIM-1 might uh, ignore the important physiological aspect of phase uh, separation, for instance, of uh, ingested lipids in the real stomach. Is the idea of horizontal stomach a limitation of the TIM-1 model? Yes. So the answer is clearly yes. So the, the horizontal stomach was initially designed to have a more homogeneous gastric con content and allow um, yeah, more standardized gastric emptying. But we all know that that's not the truth. We all sit upright while we eat and we all have a, this J shape of our stomach, which results to phase separation and, and ultimately also in, in phase specific emptying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then a question related to the membrane. Uh, so what kind of membrane is being used in the filtrating unit in the TIM system? Mm -hmm. And is it adjusted use... to a specific uh, API? So if there are specific absorption characteristics, is uh, another uh, material being considered or is it just a standard material? Yes, certainly. So, so we, we have a major differentiation between water soluble and lipophilic compounds. In the pharma, there almost all compounds are lipophilic or low have low solubility. So we typically use filtration unit that allows the withdrawal of micelles uh, in which the APIs are incorporated when once lipophilic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Andre, I don't know whether we still have question, time for questions because... I say we move on. Uh, yeah. And thanks for keeping on yeah. time and plenty of okay. questions. There are a number uh, of questions still there and you can type the answer and they will appear in the answer box. Okay, thank yeah. you, Suzanne. Okay, thank, thank you. you again, Suzanne. Thank you. So thank our you. next speaker is from uh, ProDigest Belgium, Frederic Mons, and he will introduce the Shime and the Diamond uh, system. Here we go. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Andrea, for a nice introduction. Uh, so, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, indeed, uh, today I will present you to the Shime and Diamond technology platform. So, first, uh, a small introduction about uh, the company. Uh, so, ProDigest was founded in 2008. We have 40 employees working at uh, ProDigest and we are expanding. And we are actually a service provider and we provide services towards external uh, clients to accelerate, let's say, the R&D activities of these companies. And internationally, we have contracts uh, with uh, uh, customers around Europe, USA, Asia and Africa. So actually, we're uh, active worldwide. So what is our expertise? That's the gastrointestinal tract, let's say. So what we actually do is we develop and we use unique laboratory setups that simulate the complete gastrointestinal tract. 
So the complete gastrointestinal tract, that means that we have both an artificial stomach, a small intestine and a colon. And by using these models, we can answer different research questions. So we can focus on digestion, absorption, microbial fermentation in the colon, host microbiome interactions, probiotic survival, drug dissolution permeation, and targeted release dosage formed, among others. What is very important uh, from, a, let's say, a preclinical view of uh, point of view is that you always need to have a certain in vitro toolbox. Um, so that means that we can generate tailor-made experimental setups, which are based on the compound characteristics, but also on the research question. And because of that flexibility, we can go to static models, let's say, where we can go for high throughput testing and separate parameter testing, because sometimes it's really important to really focus on one single parameter and then extrapolate it towards the broader scope. And from the static models, we can go to semi-dynamic models and then full dynamic models, which have a higher bioreleance complexity and will generate more information. So more parameters will influence each other. And in the full dynamic models, we have the shine model and the diamond model on which we will focus today. Always very important uh, to take into account is uh, when you want to build in vitro models, which are in vivo predictive, then you need to uh, simulate two things, let's say. On the one hand, you need to use bioreleant media, which is important, but you can use this bioreleant media in a beaker, let's say, in a static model. But when you combine this bioreleant media with bioreleant in vitro tools that really simulate, let's say, the complete dynamics and permeation of the gastrointestinal tract, then you get towards uh, uh, a clearer view and a better simulation of your system being capable of actually simulating what is happening in vivo. And that's, let's say, the core expertise of ProDigest. So very briefly, I will introduce you to the Shime technology platform because I think uh, numerous publications has come out uh, since uh, the development of that platform. So I will not go too much into detail here. So. The in vitro gut simulator, the SHIME, so it's a simulator of the human intestinal microbial ecosystem. And it's a simulator that both simulates the physiology, but also the microbiology of the gastrointestinal tract. So when you look at the, the middle picture, let's say, uh, this is a fully automated computer controlled uh, system in vitro tool that actually simulates what is happening in vivo. So in vivo, you have the segmentation, let's say. So first food or whatever, an oral dosage form enters the stomach, then it's emptied inside the duodenum, then it passes through uh, the eunum and the ileum, and then finally it enters the colon and the colon is subdivided in the proximal, transversal and distal colon. Each, um, each region, let's say, has a microenvironment of pH, of uh, enzymes, of uh, concentrations of different nutrients, but also microbiota. So when we look at the shine system, let's say, and we go from the left to the right, you see that we have six reactors here. So three times a day, food enters the stomach, and then the stomach in which the digestion starts is emptied inside the duodenum, and the duodenum is then emptied in the ileum. And furthermore, the ileum is emptied into the colon, which is subdivided into the proximal transversal and distal column. Very importantly, each of these uh, compartments has its own physio uh, physiology, but also its own microbiology. And next to only simulating the luminal microbiota, let's say, so the, the microbiota which is present in the lumen, we are also capable to simulate the microbiota which is attached to the mucosal surface uh, that lines, let's say, the colonic, uh, colonic uh, site. And this we do by using mucus uh, covered microcosms. So this is a fully dynamic system that we can use for long-term administration studies. And we can take samples from each of these different compartments and look where let's say a certain uh, action is happening. So based on the research question, where is something degraded? Where is absorption happening? Where uh, is a certain compound being dissolved or not? So that's one thing. So the, let's say um, the whole company was the, built around this shy model. So actually in the beginning, we were really focusing on the microbiota part, let's say. 
So we have the upper gastrointestinal part. So in the micro, uh, microbial part, we can look at drug bug interactions, let's say, and targeted release dosage forms. So what we actually did was then we focused, let's say, on the upper gastrointestinal tract, and we actually wanted to improve this and to make it better based on the nice literature data that are now present uh, uh, in the community to really reflect, let's say, uh, the upper gastrointestinal tract to be capable to get nice uh, data about drug dissolution and permeation. And that's why the DIMOT was created. So when we look at the DIMOT technology platform, so the DIMOT is the dynamic intestinal absorption model. So the, the, the keystones uh, behind the development of the, the DIMOT, let's say, is first of all, your dissolution should be good, uh, simulated in an adequate way. Yeah. So you need to have a bioRelevant simulation of the dynamics of the gastrointestinal tract. So when you look at static in vitro models, yeah, you have, let's say, a gastric step in which you dissolve your compound or you just add your compound to the stomach phase, and then the stomach phase is poured out into the small intestinal phase. But this is not like it is happening in vivo. So in vivo, you have a lot of dynamics playing, and these dynamics have a big impact on the dissolution and the permeation of an oral substance. When you just look at, let's say, static models versus dynamic models, uh, in a static uh, model, your pH will be constant, uh, or you have a constant low pH or a constant high pH. You know, of course, in vivo, uh, in a fat state condition, you have a sigmoidal pH decrease. The volume in a static model in the gastric step, so when we look at the stomach in the upper part, is constant. In vivo, that's not the case because you have gastric emptying playing there. API concentration, static model, constant. In, uh, in vivo, you have dilution due to gastric emptying and gastric secretions, and also the enzyme concentrations, because today we are talking about digestion models. Yeah, of course, yeah, in a static model, you have constant high concentrations of enzymes, whereas in vivo, you have increasing enzyme concentrations due to the secretions. But also the enzyme activity is, uh, let's say, deferring in function of time because the pH in your system is, let's say, changing in function of time. So that means that you have a dynamic substrate enzyme ratio. When we look at the small intestine, the same applies for the small intestine. In a static model, everything is constant. In vivo, it's not the case. You have a pH difference in between the duodenum and the uinum. The API concentration is dynamic due to gastric emptying, duodenal emptying, and duodenal secretions. Your biosalt concentrations are dynamic in function of time. Also, your enzyme concentrations and the substrate enzyme ratio is dynamic in function of time. So, yeah, we were talking uh, in the last talk of TNO about uh, lipophilic compounds, so BCS2 compounds. So, yeah, they have a very poor aqueous solubility. So, there are a lot of enabling formulations now uh, that try to overcome, let's say, this uh, solubility limited uh, bioavailability. So what you can do is uh, increase the solubility of a compound, but that doesn't directly mean that you have an increased permeation because there is something like the solubility permeability interplay. So when a drug enters your duodenum, it can be present as a molecular soluble, uh, soluble drug, but it can also be entrapped in colloidal phases, like for instance, with cyclotic stains, surfactants and other formulations, or in a fat state conditions uh, with food, um, compounds and micelles. But of course, when we have a dissolution model, let's say that uh, only uh, simulates dissolution, you will both measure the apparent solubility and the molecular solubility. But it's only the free unbound drug that is capable to permeate across the small intestinal uh, uh, barrier. So there is a need for discrimination between apparent and molecular dissolved drug. So there is a need for an absorptive environment in a dynamic dissolution system. And that's why we came up with the DIMOT. So the, what we wanted to do was we wanted to have a dynamic gastrointestinal tract to look at the dynamics of dissolution. But as is occurring in vivo, we wanted to interconnect, let's say, dissolution and absorption. And this in a physically interconnected way. So when you look at the DIMOT, it's a two compartmental system. Uh, this is the validated system. We have an extension towards the other regions of the gastrointestinal tract. And actually, in fact, you have the stomach, 
at the start of an experiment, um, you will have uh, a full dynamic system in which the stomach uh, receives this gastric secretions and, this, and then is emptied mono exponentially or linearly depending on the perennial state. Inside a second vessel that comprises an inner vessel, which is surrounded by a semi permeable membrane and a sink solution. So here the dissolution in the duodenum is happening and your dissolution is physically interconnected with your permeation. So what you don't actually get is a dynamic dissolution model with interconnected online permeation. You can sample at each time point without disrupting the system. So you can really look at what is happening in the stomach, what is happening in the duodenum, what is happening in the blood, in the sink solution, let's say. We use in vivo relevant dissolution volumes and permeation surface to uh, donor volume ratios. We are flexible in the pore size of the semi-permeable membrane. We have membranes that are uh, compatible with excipients, bile salts, and enzymes. So the excipients will not cause any um, damage towards the permeation barrier. And of course, a system, an in vitro system should be flexible. Everything is pH controllable, and we are flexible in all the different aspects, parameters of the system. Just to give you a small example of what the diamond can do, uh, we did an in vivo in vitro correlation study where we looked at the negative food effect on a weak basic compound in Dinavir. So actually, when we look at the uh, in vivo data, let's say, obtained by Carver in 1999, yeah, so in Dinavir uh, is a weak basic drug with PKs of 3.7 and 5.9. So it was shown that there is a negative food effect for uh, in Dinavir. The hypothesis was that the negative food effect was due to the higher pH in the stomach and slower gastric emptying, yeah, because you have a weak base, a weak base needs a very low pH in the stomach. So actually in this in vivo study, they performed fasted experiment and fat experiments with isocaloric meals. So a protein meal and a carbohydrate meal, let's say. And what you see is when they measured the pH of the stomach, you saw that when you have a protein meal, of course, the pH of the stomach is increased. And then you really see in the, the plasma concentrations that you have very low exposures of indinavir sulfate. When you have a fasted state condition, so the diamonds, uh, diamonds, uh, diamonds uh, then you have a very low pH in the stomach. And then you really see a very high exposure. Yeah. However, when you have a, a carbohydrate meal, the pH of the stomach remains very low. And despite that, you still have a negative food effect. So there are a lot of different aspects that are playing here that generate that negative food effect. So what we actually did in the diamond, we replicated that uh, study completely the same. So with the same food, whatever. Um, and what we actually performed was a fasted state condition. So if, if you look at the, the figure fasted, we performed a study, uh, so uh, a fat state condition with a protein meal, so Ensure Plus, and we performed a fat state condition with a low pH in the stomach, so a carbohydrate meal. But what we actually did was, okay, we collected samples in function of time, uh, and we determined the area under the curve inside the duodenum of the solid uh, concentration of the drug. And when you take the fasted state as 100%, then you see that the area under the curve of the solid concentration under an ensure plus condition uh, decreases till 66%, which is actually not good, but not that bad, let's say. And when you have a low pH condition, so a low pH in the stomach under fat state conditions, you even see that the pH, uh, that the uh, area under the curve of the duodenum increases as compared to the fasted state condition. So not much to worry, let's say, about that negative food effect. This would have been the case when we would only look at dissolution, let's say. But in the diamond, we have a dynamically interconnected dissolution and permeation. And when we then look at the absorbed fraction inside the diamond, and we take the fasted state condition as 100% uh, uh, as the absorbed fraction, then you really see that ingestion of Ensure Plus decreases the permeated fraction with 73%. In vivo, it was 68%. And with a low pH uh, uh, fat meal, uh, it decreases uh, the permeated amount with 35%. In vivo, 45%. So the, actually, the, the main point here is when we would only look at dynamic dissolution systems, they are only capable to generate kinetic data about the dissolution 
and they will underestimate the fruit effect. But when you have dynamic dissolution systems with coupled online permeation like the DIMOP, you generate kinetic data about dissolution of a drug, and you're capable to discriminate between solubilization and supersaturation, thereby, uh, thereby more accurately predicting the kinetics of food effects on the final bioavailability. So to conclude, uh, yeah, as a service provider in in vitro models, I think it's very important that you always need to use an in vitro toolbox for preclinical testing to accelerate and de-risk product development. That you need to be capable to use static systems for high throughput and single parameter testing. That you need to have these dynamic systems for more complexity and more bio relevance. And the choice of that model is depending on your research question the type of product that you are testing and the stage of your product development. Furthermore, the colonic microbiota can have a huge impact on drug release, drug bug interactions and digestion in general. So you have a region specific microbiota, you have the ileal microbiota versus the proximal transversal and distal microbiota. You have a mucosal versus a luminal microbiota and there should always be a translation of in vivo functionality towards the in vitro system. And the Shine technology platform captures the complexity of the gastrointestinal tract and is capable of doing that. And the final absorption of a drug is, of course, depending on the dynamics of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, dictating its dissolution and the solubility permeability interplay. So you need to have an accurate simulation of the dynamics of the gastrointestinal tract to get a nice dissolution profile. And this should be interconnected physically with permeation to discriminate between apparent and molecular solubility. And the DIMOT simulates this dynamically interconnected dissolution and permeation. And hereby, I want to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Frédéric, for this very nice presentation. The Scheim system is one of the most well-known, but I, but I didn't know exactly the, the DIMOT the model, so that's very interesting. We have already a lot of questions for you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, can I start with one quick question? In your introduction, you, men you mentioned the mucus-covered microcosm. Can you tell us what it is exactly? Is it uh, uh, kind of particles covered with mucus, with bacteria in them? Yeah, so it's uh, indeed particles covered with mucus. And uh, what you actually do is you put them inside the reactor. And when you put them in the reactor, the microorganisms that are naturally attaching to the mucus, let's say, will attach to that mucosal surface. So that means when you do not have this simulatory power, and you put a fecal sample of a certain individual inside your shine system, which is a continuous system, you will have a washout, let's say, of that specific microbiota. So by incorporating this simulation, you have a long-term administration study in which you can, in fact, maintain the microbiota diversity as present in the human individual over a long time period. Okay, excellent. So first question from Natalia, how do you sample, permeate, remove samples? What pore size membranes do you use? Uh, default uh, pore size is 3.5 kilo delta. Okay. Um, well, the second question is also on, uh, you, answered, uh, you answered it, it's on the, the membrane. Uh, when you couple the small intestinal compartment to the colon compartment, do you apply any additional in-between treatment to the effluent, such as enzyme deactivation? Uh, enzymes will be deactivated anyway eh, when they go, uh, let's say, through the colon. Eh? So you have the dilution, let's say, uh, the, the, the enzymes will be uh, functioning in function of their pH. But the fact that you have lower enzymatic activity, let's say, in the colon, is because the colon microbiota will destroy the enzymes because they use it as a food substrate. So in fact, by adequately simulating the colonic microbiota, you will in fact go to the good levels of enzymes which are present. It has also been shown, for instance, in IBD patients, which have a dysbiosed microbiota, that the enzyme levels can be much higher in the colon as compared to healthy individuals, because the microbiota there is dysbiosed. So you do not have all these different members that can degrade all these different enzymes. So this is all simulated in the Shine technology platform. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we need to move on. André, but you will see that there are several other questions. So thank you for answering them, Frédéric. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Frédéric. Uh, 
again so thank you for the audience for asking all the questions keep keep going there uh, start with the name of the presenter because we we have a lot of questions coming in there we are 250 people live at the moment which is a, a good number and we are live on youtube so our next speaker is from uh, um um, from INRA in Rennes, Stephen Lefontaine, and there's a pre-recorded uh, talk, and Stephen will be there live afterwards. There we go. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephen Lefontaine, researcher at INRAE in Rennes, and I will talk about the DG system. So DG is standing for Digester Dynamic Gastrointestinal. Uh, so it is a, a French system. Here is a schematic representation of that system. So it is a computer control uh, dynamic system. We have an electronic interface and uh, we will handle uh, the steering, pH, oximetry, uh, redox potential if we want, temperature, all the flux of the pump uh, using a, a non-made uh, software, which is called Storm. So it is uh, very similar to other system. We have a feeding of the food reaching the stomach and we have a transfer uh, into the duodenum and then a transfer into the small intestine. So in that version of the uh, DG, there, there are three compartments. Uh, holder version has a, are only two compartments, a stomach and a small intestine. Uh, so we have many pumps to add uh, the acid, the enzyme, uh, bicarbonates, etc. We can also work uh, in a control atmosphere using nitrogen uh, within the small intestine. And uh, we can sample either within uh, the compartments or also within the transfer tubing. So depending on, on the experiments. The reality looks like this. So first we have the STORM software here, very friendly. Uh, for instance, we can uh, tell the system that we are collecting a sample uh, and how much of it, so that it will compute the gastric volume, uh, for instance, uh, uh, accounting for that sample collection. Uh, for the hardware, it is quite class classical. We have piston pump to feed the gastric compartment in which you will see that uh, we are using uh, double jacket beakers. You can see a pH electrode here, uh, the steering engine and the steering blade uh, within the compartment. Uh, below, you will see the emptying pumps that will feed the duodenum and so on uh, up to the small intestine. Uh, here is a syringe to collect the sample. Uh, and we uh, have the food here and uh, digestive fluids uh, close to, to the system, uh, which will feed all the compartments uh, with, with dedicated pumps. The operating parameters we are using are very dependent on the experiments we are running. Uh, in REN, we are studying a lot the digestion of human milk and infant formula uh, in infants. So uh, here is one example. We can ask for a speed of ingestion, uh, for the gastric and small intestinal digestion, we will prepare fluids that we believe are correct in terms of uh, enzyme activities and also in terms of flux of addition within the compartments. And for the addition of acid or bicarbonate, uh, these will be made uh, depending on the pH we want uh, in each compartment. To try to be physiologically relevant for the gastric pH, most of the time we are looking in the literature for in vivo data. So here again, the example of uh, is human milk and infant formula. Uh, you may see that uh, the in vivo data show a very slow decrease of the pH as a function of time, so in infants. So from this, we can build a model here, a linear decrease of the pH uh, that uh, we can use in storm. So we enter directly the formula and STORM will manage to reproduce that uh, pH curve. So it is working like a pH stat system. It is adding acid up to the target value and stop if ever uh, the target value is reached. Uh, as a matter of course, if we, if we don't have any uh, in vivo data uh, corresponding to the system we are studying, we can still uh, ask the pump to, to deliver, for instance, a constant flow rate of, uh, of acid. Now for the transfer of one compartment to another, we are using the mathematical model of Elashoff. 
so in which uh, the residual volume within the compartment is computed as a function of uh, the G half, so the, the half emptying time of the compartment, and uh, the beta parameter here, uh, which will be used to, to modify the curve shape. So you have example uh, just below here. Uh, we can do an exponential uh, decrease or a more gentle uh, 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 emptying. Uh, so again, uh, from the literature, we try to find uh, those parameters, so T half and beta, that we will apply uh, in, in the software to, to control the transfers. The first validation of the DG system uh, dates from 2014. So it was a validation on protein digestion in infant formula. Uh, so in that study, there were uh, three experiments uh, run with the DG system and uh, an in vivo study with uh, 18 piglets. So as you may see in, in those graphs, uh, the, the protein digestion was very similar in both uh, the stomach and the small intestine with regard to in vivo and in vitro data. So on the left side for caseins and on the right side for beta lactoglobulin. So this was measured by uh, immunoreactivity uh, using uh, uh, ELISA. Since 2014, several other validations have been made. Uh, here is probably the last one with a study on four plant-based foods. So with two solids and two liquids. So you may see tofu, soy milk, uh, seitan. Seitan is a wheat-based uh, food. Uh, and a P emulsion. So all of these four matrices were uh, digested with a GG in order to predict the in vitro digestibility of their proteins. In vivo data were used again to set the parameter of the in vitro protocol. Uh, so this time using a mini pig uh, study. Uh, and first of all, for the gastric pH. So in the paper of Renault et al, uh, they measured the pH within the stomach of the mini pigs using three kinds of, exp uh, of measurements. So first of all, with uh, two pH probes connected to a catheter and the pH sensor. Also a pH wireless capsule that is linked with a cable here to the catheter, but just to maintain the location of the capsule uh, for the duration of the experiment. It is connected by Wi-Fi uh, to the pH sensor. And also, they did some ex vivo pH measurements. So the results they obtained are slightly variable depending on the techniques uh, we, they used for the pH measurement. But overall, we have clear tendencies for the four matrices, for tofu and soy meal, for instance, uh, or for setan and pH emulsion. We see that the liquid uh, matrices have a, a slower decrease in pH at first before uh, a sharper decrease next. So using a model uh, uh, fitting those curves, uh, we can enter it into the STORM software and uh, reproduce the in vivo pH during our in vitro experiment. Gastric emptying was also measured in mini pigs. So they were able to measure the T half uh, of the gastric emptying curve and the beta, uh, so the, the shape parameter, for setan, tofu, soy milk, and pH emulsion. So again, these parameters were used uh, in the in vitro uh, experiments. Now the main results of uh, this in vivo in vitro comparison, uh, and more precisely on the digestibility of proteins. So in vivo, we can measure the true uh, protein digestibility or the apparent uh, digestibility. And as you may see, uh, apparent digestibility were very similar using uh, in the in vitro and in vivo studies uh, for tofu and soy milk. Uh, they even tried to compare the gastric proteomes uh, between in vivo and in vitro studies. And as you may see, uh, the, the peptidomic data are quite similar in tendency for both in vivo and in vitro uh, studies as a function of time. So this is other uh, validation of the DG system uh, is more recent and is only one example of uh, several that now exist uh, on that system. So like most of us, I presume, 
Uh, we are trying to continuously improve our system. And one ongoing development is on the mimicking of the intestinal absorption of nutrients. So for this, we are using dialysis fibers that are connected to the small intestinal uh, compartment of our system. So this enables to simulate the nutrient absorption and with the hope that the concentration profiles that we can measure after the membrane uh, could be compared to in vivo data obtained in the peripheral blood. All the results I've shown you uh, comes from my research unit in Rennes, SGLO, but there are five laboratories of INRAE that are equipped with the DG system. So one is in Nantes, uh, Béia, one is close to Paris, Seafood, one is in Clermont-Ferrand, CAPA, and one is in Avignon, uh, Escupov. So in total, we are studying various kinds of foods, so dairy and egg products, mostly in Rennes, bread, cakes, uh, in different places, maybe mostly in seafood, uh, but also lipid emulsions uh, in Beya and Escupov, fruit and vegetable in Escupov, uh, meat uh, in Clermont-Ferrand at Capa. So we are studying in general the bioaccessibility of micro and macronutrients, but also uh, some consideration with regard to the digestibility of nutrients, uh, lipid oxidation, the chronology of enzymatic action, uh, in particular in the gastric uh, phases uh, with regard to the salivary amylase and uh, gastric lipase. Uh, in Paris, they have also studied the survival of some microorganisms uh, within the GI tract conditions, so more for probiotics uh, application. So many kinds of experiments can be made uh, in France with that system and uh, with different labs, depending on uh, the kind of foods and uh, the kind of nutrients you are interested in. With that, I thank you a lot for your attention. And I also uh, do some special thanks to the creators of the DG system. So Thomas Cateno, Zervé Guillemin, Isabelle Souchon and Daniel Pic uh, from Paris and Olivia Ménard and Didier Dupont uh, in Rennes. And I also thank uh, Olivia and Didier for sharing some slides uh, for that presentation. Thank you a lot. Okay, so thank you, Stephen, for uh, this uh, uh, clear presentation. Uh, we have uh, several questions in the Q&A. So first question relates to the use of uh, human milk. And uh, uh, the question is whether you are also then, uh, if you're using human milk, are you also using human gastric lipase? Uh, yes. So yes, we are using gastric lipase, uh, human gastric lipase, I don't think so. But in general, we are using uh, a recombinant uh, gastric lipase from rabbit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, then the question, what uh, presently uh, does uh, talk about the, the third generation, Digi? Um, oh, what's the advantage or the improvements over the previous versions? So I'm not sure of the numbering of the, <laughs> of the version. Yeah. Uh, I assume it is for the, for the third compartment because before there were only two compartments, one for the gastric and one for the small intestine. Uh, now there is a third one. And in fact, the, the reason for this originally, I think is because of uh, the study on the survival of microorganisms. Because uh, we are adding bile, in particular bile, uh, in the second compartment, and uh, there was some fear that uh, the microorganism could uh, feel a local, uh, very high concentration in bile, which can be very stressful for them. And so for that reason, there was a decision to, to, to make a third uh, compartment so that there is no more uh, high concentration of bile in, pre in, in that compartment. So this is, a, let's say, a, a way to, to, yeah, to be more careful on, on, on high local concentration. Yeah. Okay, another uh, question from uh, Isabel Germain, uh, who refers to slide seven and mentions that the SDs or the standard error of mean shown on the graphs are quite large. Um, any idea how we can improve this? Uh, because the number of uh, samples or technical modifications 
especially when we are looking for small changes between the two treatments. Uh, so I'm not sure which, which was uh, slide seven. Uh, and I was also not involved in, in that particular experiment. So I'm, I'm not that sure uh, what's about. Did you, have you seen it? Uh, is that uh, with regard to the ELISA results maybe? I think it is uh, probably the validation for the uh, digestion of infant formula. So I think that's the standard deviation were quite high, especially for the in vivo, because we had 18 piglets and there was a huge inter-individual viability. But uh, maybe you can comment on, on, on the viability that we observe usually with the DG that are quite good, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so in vivo, I'm not sure of the data, probably uh, I, uh, standard deviation, but uh, in vitro, uh, we, we, the experiments now we have show that we, we have a very good uh, reproducibility between, uh, be between the data. So in general, I, I would say it is less than uh, 10 percent variation, uh, more generally around five. Yeah. Okay, um, a question from uh, Lucy Arini. Kova, uh, do you study also whole food applications, for instance, for a new type of food? Uh, whole food, yes, we are even uh, studying sometimes meal. Uh, one problem we have uh, is that the tubing can, uh, can, can uh, st the food can remain stuck in the tubing from time to time. So depending on the food we are studying, so this has, is an issue that we need to work on uh, when, uh, when we have difficult food, let's say. But most of the time we, we find conditions or ways to, let's say, uh, uh, get rid of that, uh, the sticky part. Uh, so in general, it is only in a, in a short moment of the, of the digestion. So in general, at the start, it is easy. At the end, it is easy. So in the middle of it, sometimes we, are, we, we face some difficulties, but we have been digesting cakes, uh, omelets, uh, uh, vegetable uh, foods. Uh, so many different kinds of foods and uh, even a um, mixture of foods. Yeah. yeah, very good. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you today as well. Uh, yeah, okay, so thank you. And, uh, Excellent, yeah. Thanks for staying uh, on time as well, yeah, uh, Stephen. Um, Thank you. So our next speaker, we stay in France, so we're going back to Clermont-Ferrand, and our next speaker, Sy Sylvain Denis, on the engineered stomach and small intestine. Stephanie, can you share your, sorry, Stephanie, uh, Sylvain, can you share your screen, please? Can you go to the very top there, parameter? Yeah. Ah. yeah, perfect. It's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Good morning um, or good afternoon. It depends where you stand to all participants. I thank the organizers to invite me as a speaker and to give me the opportunity to present the dynamic in vitro system we developed, named ASIN, for engineered stomach and small intestine model. Let me uh, first introduce myself and my responsibilities. Since 2023, I'm a research engineer at the University of Clermont-Ferrand. I work in the mixed research unit called MEDIS for microbiology, digestive environments and health. Our main topics focus on interactions of food and digestive microbiota of human and animals with their environment. Since most, uh, almost one year, I lead the one of the four thematic of the unit called InnoVitro, dedicated to improve tools and methods and develop new ones used to characterize and study digestive environments and microbiota. In this con context, I daily manage the platform called uh, Digest Eve, um, which includes our, all our dynamic in vitro systems, 
and many programs involving them, especially those in relation with private companies. I would add that our platform uh, and expertise are well recognized. Uh, Digest IV is part of UCA Partner, a service of our university that ensures to researchers and enterprises easy access to cutting edge equipment facilities and expertise. In association with two complementary structures dedicated to human investigation, we constitute the platform Primum, supported by our region. And last year, we integrated the new infrastructure called Calis, supported by INRAE, which gather many French platforms and structures in the field of human nutrition. So ESIN is a multi-compartmental dynamic in vitro model of the human stomach and small intestine. It can be extended to various small gastrics. Originally, it has been developed to overcome some limitations identified in the current in vitro multi-compartmental gastrointestinal models. Essene is composed of six successive compartments, a middle reservoir, a salivary ampoule, the stomach, and the free part of the small intestine. Different peristaltic pumps ensure the transit of the meal and the digestive content from one to another compartment and the inputs of secretions into the right compartment. Temperature and pH probes control those parameters. A pharmaceutical basket can be added into the stomach and manually transferred to the small intestine. Finally, the lab view software from National Instrument was used to control the system. ESIN presents an original architecture for its gastric compartment. It was specially designed to adjust its volume thanks to two pistons. Um, um, excuse me, thanks to two pistons surrounding a central gastric chamber where all inputs, outputs, and probes are connected. Those pistons can move toward or away each other and in the same time, they continuously move in a back and forth movement to mix the gastric chime. The inner volume is adjusted according to the volumes entering and leaving the gastric compartment. The stomach was designed to manage realistic food particles up to 10 millimeters and to reduce their size passing the chime through a flange with holes of different diameters. This flange can be easily changed to optimize whole diameters and optimize the reduction of particle size. At the end of gastric emptying, pistons are close to the central gastric chamber, which contributes to, to limit the retention of food residues. But the most striking innovation of the ESIN stomach is the design of the gastric chamber that enables to reproduce the biphasic nature of gastric emptying observed in vivo. An indentation inside the main chambers allows the passage of liquids and small sized particles less than two millimeters in a secondary chamber. Large sized particles stay in the main chamber, but the further, but be, uh, to be further degraded. Two outputs, each connected to a peristatic pump, allow the differential gastric emptying of liquids and solids, respectively. These two pumps are programmed to follow specific profiles as observed in humans. The liquids emptying follows an exponential Elashoff curve without lag fast period, while solids uh, emptying ful fulfills a linear law after a lag fast of 30 minutes. In addition, Ezin is also able to reproduce and control many parameters linking, linked to digestive process. Some of them are more specific to our system. Indeed, Ezin is able to simulate the time course of the meal, and this one has not to be thoroughly premixed. Saliva is continuously added to the meal before it is introduced into the stomach, so that both solutions have a contact of 20 seconds. Usual gastric and duodenal secretions are added, but the system is able to deliver variable quantities of each one during time. 
Each compartment has its own pH profile in function of time. That is crucial in the case of the stomach, but it is also known that pH varies into the duodenum during postprandial period. Azine also controls the temperature of each compartment, the transit between them, thanks to variable peristatic pumps and their volume, thanks to level sensors. As I already mentioned, a pharmaceutical basket can be used to manage the transits of pills and tablets from the stomach to the ileum. Like the Team 1 system, both jejunum and ileum of azine are equipped with a dialysis system that reproduces the passive absorption of water on digestion products through hollow fibers. Finally, small intestinal content can be flushed with nitrogen to limit or even eliminate oxygen. Of course, as many gastrointestinal systems, azine arbors some limits. Mastication is not reproduced here. We can imagine to replace the meal reservoir by an artificial masticator, but as we design our stomach to digest real-sized food particles, it is not a great issue. Our system, especially the small intestinal part, does not reproduce the contractions of the intestinal membrane, which normally mixes gently the intestinal content with secretions. It is almost impossible to use human enzymes. So as many of us, we replace them by porcine enzymes. The system is not able to conduct some feedback effects. I mean that all systems follow the protocols and the parameters you introduce in, in the software, but they are not generally not able to uh, respond or adapt alone to a biological parameter. As an example, if you compare the digestion of two meals, one containing viscous fibers, for example, the system will not reduce alone the gastric emptying so, uh, of this meal. You should adapt your protocol to this specific meal. The absence of intestinal membrane causes different limits of which the lack of some enzymes involved in the final hydrolysis of small peptides and ozids. Associated to the membrane, we have no resident microbiota in our system. However, the small intestinal microbiota is important for health and is involved in the transform transformation of many compounds. The three last points are very common. Everyone knows the difficulty to get useful in vivo data. And as for all complex dynamic in vitro systems, they need qualified technicians to be correctly used and maintained, and they are not really appropriate to screening studies. To resume, the main advantages of the ASIN model are listed here. The progressive introduction of the meal with more realistic particle size, the continuous addition of saliva, the selectivity of liquid and solids gastric emptying, the flexibility of secretion deliveries and pH profiles in all compartments, and the dialysis system that prevents saturations and inhibition effects due to accumulation of released compounds. Acin can be used for many applications in different fields. In nutrition studies, we evaluate, for example, the digestibility of macronutrients or the impact of food transform transformation process. In pharmaceutical studies, to determine, for example, the release of API according to Galenic formulation. And in microbiology and food safety studies to evaluate the survival of probiotic and pathogens. As an example of application, I will present part of the results we obtained to validate our prototype in the pharmaceutical field. We studied the liberation of ferropylene from a sustained release form in vitro and in vivo. The main parameters we input in the system are presented here. The protocols uh, re uh, reproduce, the protocol reproduced the digestion of a tablet swallowing with a glass of water. It is characterized by rapid gastric emptying with a half emptying time of 15 minutes and a rapid acidification of the gastric content. The figure on the right illustrates the variable deliveries of secretions during time. 
the tablet was introduced into the pharmaceutical basket, and this one was left during different periods in the stomach and the small intestine compartments in accordance with mean in vivo transit time. In vivo study was conducted on six healthy subjects. They swallowed one tablet with 200 milliliters of water after overnight fasting. Figure A uh, shows the cumulative percentages of theophilins absorbed in dialysis fluids of the azine system and in plasma uh, uh, of human. In vitro, 54, more or less 6% of theophilin was absorbed after five hours, whereas in vivo, 72%, more or less 26, was recovered in the same time frame. Likewise, a point-to-point -point comparison of the two curves showed no significant difference between in vitro and in vivo data, whatever the time point. Moreover, the two curves present a similar profile which demonstrates a similar liberation and absorption of theophylin in both cases. The offsets of the curves results from differences in absorption sites between human and azine. This phenomenon is not rare in in vitro in vivo comparisons. Thus, a level A IVIV correlation was established with a slope of 1.1 and a correlation coefficient of 0.99, showing the predictive value of our in vitro system. Combined to other published data, these results demonstrate the high level of efficacy of acin in mimicking the behavior of soluble drugs in the human gastrointestinal tract. In conclusion, azine is one of the most complete system able to reproduce the upper GI tract. The model integrates and controls in an overall general way many realistic parameters of the digestion, which gives it a huge flexibility and a good accuracy. Further developments are in progress to increase the potentialities of the systems. Addition of microbiota is a real challenge because different issues have to be overcome, like the characterization of the intestinal microbiota, which is not extensively defined in different physiological situations, and how to maintain it in a dynamic environment with relatively high flow rates. Other developments uh, we are thinking about are the addition of sensors to follow new physiochemical parameters and the coupling to cell culture to study interactions between food or other components and the intestinal membrane. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm ready to uh, hear your questions. Super, thank you. Hello, hello, Sylvain. Good to see you again. Thank you very much for the very clear presentation. Again, you showed us clearly the advantages and the limits of the system, though that's very helpful. Uh, I really like the robustness of your system. Being yeah. able to work with very large food particles, it's not that easy. It's sometimes very mm -hmm. tricky. And I also like the, the differential emptying that you can have with, the, with your top pistons between the liquids and the solids. And I think that's very original. Yeah. Uh, so first, can I ask you a very quick question? What is yeah. the volume of the stomach that you uh, have? More or less 600 milliliters. Oh, okay, okay. So quite it's a, it's quite a, a realist, a real, more realistic size. Yeah. Okay. So you, you don't have the, the limitation of, of you know small no, small stomach no, that we no, can have no, sometimes. No, no. No. Okay. Great. Uh, a question from Isabel Germain. Uh, what would you say is the most challenging meal to process? Is it meals with high fibers, high carbohydrates, high lipids? What do you think based on your experience? Well, uh, probably uh, meals with uh, high lipids, especially because it's quite hard to, uh, to control the formation of uh, micellar particles, uh, especially in the small intestinal part, and uh, to have a, a good uh, re release or, or, or on the withdrawal of, of those micellar particles. Simulation, in fact, simulation of uh, lipid degradation is quite hard. For me. Mm -hmm. 
And another question, do you, uh, can your system be adapted to other specific population like infant, for instance? Do you, do you have, uh, let's say, smaller vessels or how do you handle that? How do you handle that? Uh, well, uh, normally we can adapt the system for different uh, physiological situations between age, uh, for example. Um, uh, of course, the volume of the stomach of an uh, infant is less uh, important than the volume of uh, human adults, but uh, we can adapt uh, it, uh, this. We can adapt also the transit time or, or especially more especially the resident time we have in each vessels. Uh, because uh, as you can see, uh, it's different from the Chinese uh, system. We do not have a, a very long intestine uh, to mimic the, 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 the transits uh, all along the, 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 the tube. Uh, but uh, with uh, uh, lowering the resident time in the different vessels, we can mimic uh, uh, more uh, infant situations. Okay. Um, Sylvain, I, I have a question. So you are based in the University of uh, Clermont-Ferrand. Yeah. What is your future plan with your model? So uh, are you doing contract work? Or are you going to replicate it? Are you going to sell it? What, what is your, what's your plan for the immediate or medium term future? Well, actually, we, uh, we, we work with a prodigist uh, to, uh, to have a... a, a upgraded version of the system. So probably in the future, uh, we will plan to, uh, to sell it. But of course, as our team belongs to the university, uh, in ourselves, we won't uh, sell the, the system like this. Uh, we, we will continue to, uh, to have collaborations with uh, researchers, but uh, uh, it's true also that one little part of my work is uh, to contract uh, directly with companies uh, using the different system we have uh, uh, in the lab. Very good. Thanks. Okay, and maybe just one quick comment because we had different questions regarding digestive lipase. Uh, as far as I yeah. know, there is no human gastric lipase avail commercially available at the yeah. moment. So yeah, the yeah, only yeah. solution it we have is the rabbit gastric extract that is commercialized yeah. by a, a small French company or yeah. fungal lipase that might have different yeah. specificity. Can yeah, you, yeah. Can you in, confirm? In the, yeah, yeah, I confirm. And uh, uh, just uh, confirm also that uh, we, we should uh, be careful with all the lipase uh, commercially available. Because, for example, in the past, uh, I, I plan to, um, to use the, the class, uh, classical uh, fun, fun, fungal uh, lipase. But in fact, this lipase was not uh, really uh, pure. And uh, as we, uh, we wanted to evaluate the viscosity of fibers uh, uh, in the mill, we, sh we finally uh, demonstrated that the lipase we used uh, uh, possessed uh, some uh, elements that degrade the viscosity uh, of, of the mill. So uh, it's a general uh, observation be careful with all the products you use. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Okay. Thank you very much, Sylvain. Very interesting presentation. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Excellent. So thank, thanks again. So we're moving on. We're leaving France at last after three talks and we are going to Slovenia. So we're going to University of Ljubljana, Maria Bogotaj, and it's a recorded uh, talk on glass bead flow through models. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maria Bugatai, and I'm coming from Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Ljubljana. I am very glad that I may present you here on this uh, joint InfoGest and Gap meeting, our uh, glass big flow through dissolution system. Uh, when we started with the development of our model, uh, we wanted to implement in this model as many physiological conditions as possible. But on the other side, we also to want to make 
very simple dissolution system, which would be easy to use and have low variability, uh, especially no additional variability due to technical problems. Uh, so uh, we uh, perform uh, the experiments in such a way uh, that we use many physiological conditions as, as many as possible and uh, we uh, use these conditions under constant values. Uh, of course, these constant values are uh, always in the physiological range and uh, always in each experiment we vary only a few parameters. We chose the conditions, the parameters that we vary on the basis of dosage form and drug that we test, and uh, more especially on the basis of the susceptibility of the dosage form to the conditions in GI tract. To be close to in vivo system, uh, we, to in vivo situation, we use flow through system and we introduce the special way of steering in our working vessel. Uh, these are uh, the basic conditions that we use mo most frequently. Uh, we uh, use flow of two milliliters per minute. We chose this flow in accordance with literature data about physiological flows. Uh, here you can see the values of the flow from stomach to duodenum in different MMC phases and also flows in jejunum and delum in fasting and fat state. Uh, you can see that two, we are with two milliliters per minute, we are close to these values. Uh, most frequently we use volume of 40 milliliters, which is uh, well in accordance with the volume of liquid in empty stomach. Of course, after uh, meal ingestion, the, there is high increase in this volume. Uh, in small intestine, uh, the volumes are in wide uh, range. With 40 milliliters, we are at the lower uh, limit, lower edge of this range. Uh, however, there are fluid pockets in the small intestine with uh, relatively low volumes. So we stay in most experiments at this value, as I said, 40 milliliters. Uh, we can increase flows and volumes in our system uh, and uh, we used uh, in higher values, especially in the cases when we want to simulate gastric emptying of water. Uh, if we simulate the situation when the tablet is uh, taken with a glass of water. Uh, also high volumes are also suitable to simulate uh, fat, fat conditions. Uh, two other parameters are also typical for our system. This is uh, movement and uh, way of movement and uh, physical contact uh, between the dosage form and environment, but I will talk about them a little bit later. Uh, of course, we keep the temperature at uh, 37 degrees and we use practically uh, classical media, most frequently described media for dissolution testing, all media, most of media for fast simulations, for fat simulations, uh, different buffers to simulate the pH changes, polymers to increase viscosity, milk and sugar, and biorelevant uh, media. Uh, here you can see the scheme of our working vessel. Uh, we introduced in our working vessel a certain amount of glass beads, and these glass beads are steered by magnetic bar. This steering by magnetic bar produces a typical movement uh, of our system in working vessel. And uh, these uh, glass beads, when steered by magnetic bar, move in the uh, so that they form waves on their surface. And these waves move around the vessel. You can see it uh, here uh, on the scheme and also here on the photo. When we put uh, the tablet in this system, in the medium, then the tablet in most cases settle on the surface of this glass bit layer and moves together with these glass bits uh, together uh, inside around the uh, vessel. Uh, here on the next uh, slide, you can see five consecutive photos 
of the tablet in working well so during the steering. Uh, you can also see the uh, waves of glass beads and this tablet waves are moving in this vessel and uh, also uh, do does the tablet. Uh, in uh, all these systems, uh, the tablet is also in physical contact with the surface of glass beads. Uh, also in the GI tract, the tablet is in most cases, if, uh, or at least very frequently, uh, in uh, physical contact with uh, mucosa, uh, so we think this is appropriate. Uh, the described system uh, is frequently and was successfully already used for testing the tablets. Uh, we also use this system uh, successfully to test the pellets, but for pellets it cannot be used always. Uh, the reason is that pellets are sometimes very small and heavy, and this, such pellets will penetrate in the layer of glass beads. And these glass beads, of course, will pre uh, press certain pressure to the pellets and may break the pellets. Of course, this is far from being physiological, so we do not use uh, uh, glass beads in such cases. And instead of glass beads, we use a device shown here below. This is one very small magnet inserted in silicon tube. There is air at the ends of this silicon tube, which makes this uh, device very light. So uh, when uh, the if the pellets are below the steering device, they will, uh, the steering device, in the magnet in the silicon tube, in most cases will not break the pellets because it is really very light. Uh, the size of silicon tube uh, corresponds to the diameter of the vessel or it's a few millimeters uh, shorter. Uh, here you can see the complete system. We have uh, four working positions, four working vessels, tubes, uh, pumps, and so on, but it can be better seen from above. Uh, here in front, you uh, see the four working vessels. On the left and on the right sides, there are vessels in which we put a fresh medium, which is pumped in working vessel. Vessels and behind uh, you can see also the vessels in which the samples are collected. Uh, all vessels are dipped in water bath, and um, the, all the vessels, uh, the working vessels, and also the vessels where the samples are collected, are steered by magnetic steerer. Uh, in most cases, we perform experiments. Uh, so that we simulate in working vessel conditions in the whole J tract. That means that we change the conditions in working vessel in accordance with the uh, conditions to which the dosage form is exposed when it travels along the GI tract. Uh, of course, we achieve this uh, by uh, changing the inflow medium in the uh, working vessel. Uh, but uh, this is one possibility. Another possibility is that we also sometimes use is that we simulate only stomach in the working vessel, stomach medium, and then we uh, pump uh, the medium out, for, uh, which is pumped out of the vessel. We uh, pump this medium in another vessel where there is uh, where we have uh, simulated intestinal fluid. And uh, so in such a way, we uh, simulate the uh, transport from the stomach to small intestine. I would like to uh, show you a few examples. Uh, here on the upper graph, you can see uh, pH profiles, which were achieved in uh, our working vessels. These pH profiles were chosen on the basis on in vivo profiles described in cited article. Uh, we chose one uh, very low and one uh, one low one and one high uh, pH profile. Of course, this is pH profile uh, in uh, along the GI tract, and uh, both uh, profiles are inside the physiological uh, range. Uh, additionally, uh, we simulated also a buffer capacity. And uh, under such changing conditions, uh, we uh, performed also the solution testing. 
And on the graph below, you can see this obtained dissolution profiles. Of course, we chose the drug with uh, pH dependent solubility. And uh, you can see that uh, in these two, under these two conditions, which are both physiological, under these two different pH profiles to which the dosage form is exposed after administration and when it travels along the GI tract, we can we obtain very different dissolution profiles. That means this is the contribution of this variability uh, of uh, pH profiles to the variability of dissolution profiles and probably also the variability of absorption and plasma profiles. Uh, the second example is simulation of the uh, gastric emptying of water when the tablet, uh, when we simulate the situation uh, of administration of tablet with a glass of water. You can see the decrease of volumes in working vessel. And uh, these two profiles were also chosen in accordance with in view profiles. Uh, we simulated uh, one low and one, uh, one slow and one fast gastric emptying profile of water, which is described in this article. Um, we performed the experiment so that we uh, put 35 milliliters of uh, hydrochloric acid in working vessel. Uh, we added 240 milliliters of water and uh, then we pumped out the uh, content out of the working vessel uh, to obtain uh, such kinetics as shown here. Again, we performed uh, the dissolution testing and for the tested tablets, we got the uh, different dissolution profiles as you see, as you can see here. And of course, this is also a contribution to the variability of dissolution and probably absorption profile. And the last uh, example, uh, we compared our system with uh, pharmacopoeial apparatus 4. Uh, we tested enteric coated pellets, which were exposed in each system for different time periods to acidic medium, and medium was then, then changed with uh, simulated intestinal medium. Uh, this uh, different times in acidic media uh, medium can also be seen from lag times here on this uh, dissolution profiles. Uh, blue are is our system, red is apparatus four, and you can see that there are differences in dissolution profile, which are most expressed when the pellets were kept in acidic media uh, for longer time periods. Uh, on the basis of these dissolution profiles, we calculated predicted in vivo dissolution profile and compare this profile for each system, of course, uh, with absorption profiles. And uh, we found out that in vitro in vivo correlation thus obtained was better for our system in comparison with apparatus 2. We ascribe this difference to the some parameters that was closer to physiological in our system in comparison with pharmacopoeia 1. So that's all for uh, about our uh, dissolution system. Let me finally thank you to all my collaborators from our faculty uh, with whom we uh, developed this system together. Uh, from very early phase, we collaborated also with company Mariel who constructed our system. And uh, during evaluation and application of this system, we collaborated also with other institutions and companies, thanks to all. I would especially like to thank to the group from U Greifswald University, uh, who enabled us to perform some measurement of our systems system uh, in uh, their lab. And I would like to thank you, all of you, for your attention. Okay, so thank you, Maria, for this uh, presentation. So uh, good to see you again. Um, uh, let, let me first ask uh, related to, you mentioned that uh, uh, for the transfer from the stomach to the small intestine, you can pump the contents, uh, but uh, uh, how do you actually deal with this uh, if the formulation is still present in the stomach compartment? 
Uh, yes, this is simulated when the, uh, uh, the formulation, if this is, for example, tablet and which does not, uh, uh, is not disintegrated in the uh, stomach, uh, then only dissolved drug will leave stomach. So uh, the, the dissolution takes place in stomach and then uh, it is transported, uh, the dissolved drug is transported in duodenum. But uh, if you want to simulate also gastric retention of a dosage form, then we just perform a few different experiments uh, as shown in the last example with pellets. And uh, we keep the dosage forum for different time periods in acidic medium and uh, then transfer it uh, uh, further. Or, okay. in, uh, or increase uh, the uh, pH in the first vessel also. Yeah. Uh, then you increase pH to then simulate the, the, in, uh, the small intestinal conditions in the first compartment. It's one possibility, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you also modulate the, uh, the viscosity of your medium? Uh, yes, uh, we usually we use the classical approach if you want to do this. Yes, uh, as usual, we use, uh, usually there is uh, there are some polymers, HPMC is most frequently used, yes. Uh, Yes, the fact is that the viscosity is too high, it's different to pump it at a constant uh, controlled value. But uh, yes, it's possible, and uh, yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm looking in the QA section, but I do not see any additional questions. Okay. I'm okay as well. Did you? Do you have any questions? Excellent. So, oh, thank perfect. You. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. Thanks for the very thank nice. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So we are moving on. Uh, we are going to Germany University of Greifswald. Uh, Philipp Schick. Um, we have a pre-recorded uh, talk by uh, Philipp Schick on gastrodur for drug dissolution and emptying. So give me a second. Here we go. Yeah, hello everybody and welcome to my little presentation. And then this short talk, I want to show you the gastric in vitro model we designed and developed in Greifswald, which is called the GastroDo. Uh, and I want to explain you this model with a little talk where I show a mechanistic approach for understanding how the prandial state determines drug dissolution and emptying. And for now, I switch off my camera to show some place, uh, place on the slides. I want to start my talk. I want to start with a classification of different types of plasma profiles, which was introduced by Kotziolik et al. some years ago. And they postulate that after the intake of IR dosage forms, so immediate release dosage forms, they can occur different types of plasma profiles under fat state conditions. Of course, these types are not fixed and there are, there are yeah, profiles in between. But uh, looks on or a look on in vivo data showed that there can be yeah, made a classification of drugs towards these profiles, uh, which are completely different. As for example, type one shows a rapid uh, plasma onset after a few minutes. Um, type two shows a rapid onset of the plasma profiles after a certain lag time, as shown here in this lighter gray, and. There are also other types, type three, which show uh, slow and uh, slow onset of plasma concentration over several hours, which more looks like an yeah, extended release dosage forms on first view, but which could also seen for iron dosage forms under fat conditions. We had in vivo data from two studies uh, for two commercial products, uh, Viagra and Adenuric. And um, I will use, or I want to show you here some of the single profiles of these two studies, which are shown in gray, and also the mean profiles shown in blue here. Uh, and as you can see here, okay, they are completely different plasma profiles here, which is not that surprising. But as you can see here, okay, the mean profile does not represent, uh, yeah, most of the profiles uh, which was observed during the study. Um, when we have a closer look to the single profiles, uh, it was here also possible to 
automated classification of the individual profiles to the yeah, introduced profiles uh, from the review. And as you can see here, okay, we have a different type of distribution for both drugs towards the uh, introduced types. So as you can see here for Viagra, we have six volunteers which can, could be classified into type one, uh, eight for type two, and the main part 20 for type three. And the picture is completely different for Alenuric. Here the main part, um, in this case nine volunteers were classified into type one, two into type two, and just three into type three. Um, so you can see here a different distrib distribution between these types of plasma onset. Since these post drugs are well absorbable, we thought, okay, um, the plasma onset and the drug profile as a whole um, has to be determined mainly by the drug dissolution uh, and disintegration process, but also by the gastric emptying, since all drug leaving the, the stomach and reaching the intestine should be absorbed within seconds or minutes. So we came to a hypothesis, which was that the different plasma profile types are caused by the characteristics of the disintegration and dissolution process of the dosage form and also by the initial localization of the dosage form inside the postprandial stomach. And this initial uh, localization of the dosage form is then highly relevant for the, of course, disintegration dissolution process, but also for the gastric emptying. Gastric emptying and fasted and fat state um, yeah, is be completely different, of course, because under fat state conditions, when we ingested a, a meal, this meal has to be digested and uh, or has to be processed before leaving the stomach. This was also investigated by Grimm and colleagues some years ago. Uh, and here in this graph, you can see some different types of meal uh, or the, the um, gastric content, content volume of different types of meal um, measured with MRI here shown in gray, red and blue. So gray was a low fat meal, red was a high fat meal and blue was a homogeneous fat meal. And on black you can see a fasted state profile. And as you can see here, okay, gastric content volumina rising after intake of the meal, which is not surprising. And the emptying pattern uh, is quite slow over time. At different time points here in zero and 60 minutes, the volunteers received 240 milliliter of water. And as you can see here, okay, the emptying during this time uh, was much higher. So first we have this increase due to the intake of the 240 milliliter. And afterwards we have a rapid emptying of exact the same amount of volume within yeah, about 30 minutes. And this phenomenon is also known as Magenstrasse and it describes that uh, non-caloric fluids like water can flow around the gastric chyme and get emptying uh, within short time and take kind of shortcut out of the gastric stomach. The gastric emptying pattern is just one uh, decisive parameter we wanted to simulate with the gastrodo. So we also wanted to have a look on the pH profiles since this is also changed uh, under fat conditions and also um, yeah, is dynamic over time, as same as the temperature profile too. Uh, and also other aspects we wanted to uh, take into consideration is the movement of the dosage form due to peristalsis and also pressure events acting on the dosage forms. And our goal was to design a model uh, or to create a model with a modular design which allows to test the influence of single parameters, which I presented here, uh, and also of certain parameters together. How does it look some uh, the transfer of in vivo data into the, the gastro do? And this I want to show with this slide. On the upper part here, you can see the in vivo data. On the lower part, you can see how we transferred it into the gastro do. And for example, here we have volume curves generated by MRI for gastric emptying. So here you can see again the emptying of 240 milliliters of water within 30 minutes. And this is how we uh, yeah, realized it in the model. So we have a kind of um, dynamic profile 
where we reduce our transfer rates every five minutes over 30 uh, every five minutes for 30 minutes and by this profile here we can also transfer 240 milliliter of a medium through our uh, gastric model we can also realize ph profiles as you can see here so in the upper part you have a ph profile measured with a telemetric capsule and have had conditions in healthy volunteers and here in the lower part you can see a ph profile how it was realized in a gastro duo over also 240 milliliter and here we try to copy this to have an increased ph in the first time and then a slow and continuous decrease uh, over time due to acidification and emptying of the um, yeah, gastric content and on the right side here you can see uh, pressure events how they were measured uh, inside the gastric stomach also with the telemetric capsule and this uh, identic telemetric capsule we also place in our uh, gastric model and as you can see here we were more or less able to copy this profile uh, measured in vivo this slide now you can see how the model looks in, in a schematic representation and I just want to shortly explain how the model works and what is what. So a central compartment of the model is the so-called gastric cell. The dosage form to be tested here um, is placed in this gastric cell between two blades. These blades are mounted on a central axis which is movable by a stepping motor therefore we can simulate movement patterns and between these blades there is also a balloon which can be inflated by compressed air and by this we are also able to simulate pressure events. We have certain uh, or we have some peristaltic pumps which are transfer media inside and outside the gastric cell and by this we are able to yeah, simulate different emptying patterns as I showed you before and by the yeah, kind of media we transfer into the cell and outside the cell we can also generate pH and temperature profiles as shown before. We have an online concentration and pH measurement direct at the outlet of the gastric cell to get uh, an insight how the concentration leaving the gastric compartment are looking and at the end we collect all media in an acceptor vessel where we can also make a quantification and therefore calculate um, how much drug has emptied the gastric compartment over time. <coughs> I just oh, I want to show now you some test programs we used for the investigations with the shown commercial products via Grand Edinburgh. And what we have done in this case study is that we have designed three test programs with our model for fat state simulation. Um, so on the, in the first program we simulated uh, the emptying of 240 milliliter of water directly at the beginning, beginning at zero minutes and we had a second program where we simulated the stomach road after 60 minutes and we had a program where we waved on simulation of the stomach road. What we also have done is that we simulated pressure and movements uh, beginning at 60 minutes up to 240 minutes um, regularly and after 240 minutes the relevant part was was over and we simulate the occurrence of the fasted state with high transfer rates and high pressure events but decisive are the first 240 minutes. I just want to show you now the results from the first study with Viagra and I just want to explain what you can see here. So in black you can see the drug concentrations at the outlet of the gastric cells as shown before. So the concentration that is leaving the gastric cell in orange you can see the pH profile uh, which was measured um, during the experience which is more or less all the same between uh, the programs since this was the pH profile we intended to simulate and in blue you can see the overall amount drug emptying uh, over time so the drug amount collected in the acceptor vessel and as you can see here um, for the first or when you compare the programs um, we have every time uh, yeah, an increase in drug concentrations leaving the gastric cells when uh, pressure and movement was simulated yeah, which can be seen here by the black curve so every time after 60 minutes um, this high concentrations increased and also this was every time connected 
with an onset of drug or drug amount in the acceptor vessel. And of course, there is an influence of the emptying pattern, so the, high, uh, the gastric emptying too. But as you can see also here for program two and three, uh, which are more or less looking the same, also in, stom uh, in program two, we had um, the stomach growth after 60 minutes. Um, the more decisive pr uh, process here was the simulating of pressure and movement. And this also fits very nice um, to the observed in vivo data, since for Viagra, we had mainly this type 3 plasma onset, uh, which can be explained by pressure and movement, which leads to mixing of drug substance into the gastric chyme and therefore the slow plasma onset for type 3. The picture is completely different for adenuric. Here you can see that we already or, or that we have nearly no concentration at the outlet of the gastric cell. <coughs> And most of the drug, or nearly all of the drug, uh, seems to be emptied in an undersolved form at small particles. And here we see, okay, the simulation of the pressure, um, starting at 60 minutes and also of the movement, does not have this main effect, but the simulation of the trend uh, of the uh, fluid emptying here is much more important. These are the time points where we have uh, high amounts of drug leaving the gastric cells. And this also fits very nice to the in vivo data, as here for adenuric we had much more profiles which so, uh, showed this rapid onset. So we can see here, okay, um, the fluid emptying, the stomach growth is here, the more the size of parameter for emptying of the drug and this also for plasma onset of the drug. So this will lead me to my conclusion. So we were able to design uh, an in vitro model with a modular approach, which allows the simulation of single physiological relevant parameters. Um, we every time need a set of experiments to identify which parameters are decisive for drug disintegration and dissolution. But by this, we are also able to detect them. Um, yeah. In a case study with two different uh, commercial products, uh, it was possible to identify how gastric emptying kinetics and peristalsis affected. Uh, plasma onset and dependency of the characteristics of the drug. So we were able to distinguish uh, which factor was decisive for which drug. Uh, but of course, the model is not perfect and it has also limitations. So in the main state, it's mainly used with uh, yeah, simple and low viscosity media. So for other questions, this model might be not that be well suited. But for now, I think it's fine, it's working well. And with this, I want to end my talk. I want to thank you for all your attention and I'm open for questions now. Thank you very much, Philippe, for the nice presentation. Uh, I, we have some questions. The first question is from George Van Aken. Hi, George. Uh, um, George is saying, it seems that you measure pressure spikes on top of a slowly varying gastric pressure. So what causes the pressure spikes in vivo? Are they very localized pressures on the sensors? How are they produced at the right time in vivo? So really a lot of questions regarding uh, these, these pressures in vivo. <laughs> yeah, uh, first of all, we have to say how the pressures uh, were measured in vivo. So in this case, it was a telemetric capsule. And of course, the picture will be a different when you have a kind of tube inside the stomach. So the form of the sensor, of course, is also uh, decisive for what kind of pressure you, you are measuring. And in this case, the basis is the so-called smart pill, a telemetric capsule. So an objective um, yeah, with the shape of a capsule, but a little bit bigger. And this were, were the kind of pressures the capsule measured uh, after postprandial application in healthy volunteers. And there is a kind of uh, yeah common signal, which is really low, which might be due to movement of the, the volunteers itself. So every time the volunteer is moving, the capsule might also be moving. And therefore, you have small signals. And these bigger signals are the real peristaltic waves which are occurring during the processing of food in the postprandial state. So when you have peristaltic waves uh, forcing the, the capsule um, into the antrum or something like this, then we have this 
higher spikes and these pressure events. And of course, the occurrence, the time points of occurrence of these events is a little bit erratic due to the position of the telemetric capsule inside the stomach. And therefore also the simulation is erratic. And this was just an example where we wanted to copy or to show, okay, we are able to copy uh, realistic profiles from volunteer also in our model. But of course, there are hundreds of other profiles depending on the, the volunteer and everything is possible. So that's the, the occurrence of this wave and this event is erratic. Okay. Uh, uh, so with the capsules, you measure pressure, but also pH. Uh, are there other parameters that can be measured with this kind of capsules? Uh, yeah, they are also able to, to measure the temperature, um, which is also quite nice because when you have a temperature measurement, then you can drink something. And if you see, okay, the, the sensor uh, measures a lower temperature, then you know, okay, the, the capsule is still in the stomach. Um, but when you don't see this temperature drop due to drinking, then it's in sign, okay, the stomach was left. So um, you can get nice profiles from the transit through the whole GI tract when you're combining all this, this information, pressure, temperature, and pH, because then you can say, okay, we have not this temperature effect any longer and we had um, a pH increase due to, the, to leaving the stomach. So with this, all this information together, you are able to say where the capsule is at the moment. Mm -hmm. And another naive question on the capsules, because I thought that you were monitoring those parameters for quite a long time, actually. So they are not transferred rapidly into the, into the small intestine. Is it because of their size? They are quite big, so they will be transferred at the very end of the, of the gastric phase. Is that, am I correct? Or? Yeah, there were different uh, study arms. So in the fasted state, the emptying can be quite fast. So when you are lucky and you apply the capsule in a kind of phase three MMC phase, then it's possible that the capsule is emptied within minutes, uh, although it's quite big. So the size is about uh, the thumb, the upper thumb, that's about, uh, the size of the capsule. But when you are lucky and you are in a fasted state and have this high or the strong peristalsis, the emptying can be very fast. In the postprandial state, the uh, uh, gastric residence times was quite long, also due to the aspect that over the day we are eating all the time and we do not really reach the, the fa fast state again after the first meal in the morning, typically. And then the, the transit time or the residence time in the stomach can be up to 24 hours. And typically, just in the next morning, you have the emptying. So the size is there, of course, also a limitation to the transit time, also in, in deeper parts of the uh, GI tract. So the transit time, for example, in the small intestine was every time about four hours. Um, smaller objects would, of course, show different transit times. That's the question, yeah. It, 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 I come in there as well because uh, uh, as it happened, I swallowed one of those cameras or a similar camera. I remember. Uh, if you're lying down, uh, it stays in the stomach much longer. Uh, but in my case, I, I consume two meals. For the second meal, I, I stay at horizontal for, for an hour. It stayed in the stomach. As soon as I got up, it, uh, it left, you know, went straight into small intestine. So it's a bit of a lock in the gastrointestinal uh, gastroenterologist. That's what I said. Uh, you never know, but, uh, but it leaves the stomach. Uh, faster when you're when you're walking around or when you're active. Okay, another question on, on the smart pill again. <laughs> Sorry, uh, how does is the smart pill itself impacting the parameters that it measure? Since its size is big, it should be emptied from the stomach later than most tablets. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I think that is what we talked before. Yeah. Um, so the the emptying time, of course, is prolonged in comparison as for example, for pellets, that's, that's no question. Um, that might be a limitation, but it's also nice because it gives you a profile of the stomach over a long time. So you see what happens when you're eating every time again. You can nicely see um, how the gastric secretion acidifies the gastric content again and so on. So you get, of course, the transit time is, is affected by the size, but that gives you all also information over a big time range, which is typically not possible with other um, yeah, measurement systems. 
okay? And in your model, the acceptor vessel, it's, it's more or less the duodenum, the duodenum right? Um, yeah, we can, can handle it this way. It's not uh -huh. typical like we do it. So um, in most of the cases, the conditions in our acceptor vessel are designed in that way that all drug reaching it uh, is perfectly dissolved because we want this feedback, has the drug uh, left the gastric cell or not? So, and when we handle it at, as a duodenal compartment, then it might be, or it could be that we have solubility problems that's depending on the drug we are using and the pharmacokinetic, uh, pharma physical chemical properties of the drug. Um, so in most cases, uh, we are not doing it this, uh, this way, but we had some tries and some experiment on it where we also uh, used it as du uh, duodenal compartment also for investigation of precipitation processes and so on. Okay, thank you very much for the clear answers. Thank Excellent. you very much. Thank you, Philip. Thank you again, very clear talk. So uh, we have two more talks. We are on the home stretch now during this um, uh, marathon uh, webinar. So we are going across the pond to uh, uh, University of California um, in Davis, United States. Gail Bornhorst is the presenter and I see Gail there. Good morning, Gail. Um, and she's giving a talk on, human, on the human gastric simulator and the talk is pre-recorded and Gail will be there uh, afterwards. Good morning, everybody, or should I say good afternoon to most of you. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to really thank the organizers for involving me in this really excellent workshop that they've put together. I think it's really great that we have an opportunity to get everyone together to talk about some of the latest advances in dynamic digestion models. So today, I'm going to talk to you about the Human Gastric Simulator, or HGS, which is a dynamic gastric model that we have developed at the University of California in Davis. So originally, this model was developed by Professor Paul Singh, and I've taken it on in the last seven or eight years. And I'm going to talk to you about our latest version and what we've been doing in our recent works. So first, we're going to just take a look at how the human gastric simulator works. And I'm going to explain it to you while we're watching a video of the simulator function. So first, to orient you in this video, we have our HGS, which is here in the middle, and it's actually surrounded by an insulated box. And we have a temperature control and thermocouples inside to control the temperature at 37 Celsius. We also have a parasaltic pump, which is <clears throat> uh, providing the gastric secretions to our gastric liner. And there's an inlet tube that comes in at the top. We have our blue liner, which is essentially our simulated stomach reactor. So that's our stomach bag that's shown here in the middle. And that actually has a J shape and can hold a large volume. Another really important part of this model are these white clamps that are actually moving that you can see in the video, creating those peristaltic contractions that are so important in gastric digestion. And then finally, we have this blue cap at the bottom, which is where our samples are actually emptied to mimic our gastric emptying process. So now that you've seen a video and you've at least gotten oriented to what the model looks like and how it runs more or less, now we're going to talk about some of the key parameters in the HGS and how they are controlled and some of the options for them to be controlled. So first we're going to start with what I would call the more standard parameters. First we have the temperature. So as you can see in the back of that box, there's actually a red glow coming. It's because one of the ways we are using to monitor to change the temperature is with a red heat lamp. And so that's monitored through this temperature control. And although we normally have it set at 37, it could be changed if needed. We also have our contraction rate. So as we watched in the video, our contractions move at a specific rate and we change those using this variable speed motor. Finally, we have the gastric liner. And again, I call this somewhat of a standard parameter because the size and shape can't really be modified very much in this current setup without running into the rollers that are creating the peristaltic contractions. However, we can vary the meal size from a minimum of about 50 grams to a maximum of somewhere 350-ish grams. You maybe could put more, but we've never tried because that's already pretty big if you're considering a meal. One other thing to note that actually is important if you're working with substances that could be easily could easily have cross-contamination, that the liners are disposable. So if needed, you can put a new liner in for each digestion to make sure what you're getting coming out is only what you would putting into the system and you don't have to worry about extensive cleaning. Now we're gonna talk about a couple of the more customizable parameters. So first we have gastric emptying. 
And as we know, gastric emptying is very important. And the way that we control this in the HGS is through a constant material emptying at set intervals. So you can see in this video here that we have material, when the material is emptied from the HGS, material comes out and we don't actually control the amount of solids or liquids or the ratio to gastric juice to solids that are coming out in the sample. Also important to note that our gastric content is not homogeneous. And I'm gonna show you an example of that later which is actually realistic to in vivo studies that have shown segregations both in gastric juice as well as nutrients and things of different buoyancy in the stomach. So we wouldn't actually expect for our whole gastric content to be homogeneous, but it does make it difficult to predict exactly what's going to be empty because there's some ratio of both solids and liquids added into the HGS as well as our gastric fluids. Then we have control of gastric secretions. So the first thing that we do in our HGS and is adding a set volume of fasting gastric juice before we start our experiment. Now we have two options that we utilize for gastric secretion rate. So we first have a constant secretion rate, which is more typically used in a lot of experiments that we can change both the secretion rate and the pH to modulate what our di empty digestive pH is going to be. And there's also the option to add a second pump in this system if there are pH sensitive enzymes. Although we have found that with pepsin, we actually just add it in with our gastric juice. We've done extensive measurements on the pepsin activity even after several hours of digestion to see that it doesn't really decrease during that digestion period. And so in the case of using constant gastric secretions, we're really just letting the food buffering capacity be the main determinant in changing the empty digestive pH profile. So just to show you that I've put this graph here that gives an example of four different meals. So this is actually the gastric pH, the pH profile of the empty digestion from the HGS over a three hour digestion. And all of these meals have exactly the same composition. They just have different buffering capacity due to variations, in moisture content, and particle size. And you can see that just due to those buffering capacity, there's a very, there's actually a pretty big difference in the pH profile. So knowing that the food properties and buffering capacity are really important in modulating both the gastric pH as well as the gastric secretions, we've also developed a variable secretion rate profile. So to come up with a variable gastric secretion control, and now this is not controlling the pH profile per se, but it's controlling the amount of gastric secretions. Now this was based on observations that we had using a growing pig model in vivo that we showed that here in this graph, you can see the moisture addition rate. So that's kind of a proxy for the estimated gastric secretions versus the distal pH, so the pH in our gastric digesta. And you actually see that there's a really nice relationship, an exponential relationship between the digestive pH and the gastric secretions, such that it might be important to take that into account when we're doing our in vitro digestions. So as a result of these observations, we use this information to develop a customized pump control for variable gastric secretion control. So my students actually went in, they figured out how to control our parasaltic pump using a microcontroller that talks to both the pH meter. So we have a pH probe that goes into our HGS and sits inside of the gastric digesta. And then that talks to the microcontroller, which tells the pump what flow rate to use. And the flow rate will change based on the pH. So based on some of the data that we had, we came up with this kind of lookup table here to see what's the measured pH inside the HGS and then what's the flow rate of simulated gastric fluid. And again, this was based on observations that we had from in vivo studies that showed that foods with higher buffering capacity and actually needed more secretions to drop the pH had a higher gastric moisture content um, and implying much higher gastric secretions. So now that we've touched on the most important parameters in the HGS, one thing that we almost always ask when we're talking about these dynamic models is what's the correlation to in vivo studies? So here I'm going to show you a couple pieces of data that are looking at our HGS model compared to some studies we've done in growing pigs. So first we're going to take a look at the dry matter gastric emptying in this graph on the left. And to orient you a little bit, our in vivo is on the y-axis and our in vitro is plotted on the x-axis. And this is again, the dry matter emptying over time. We have a medium green white rice that's shown in blue and a wheat couscous shown in green. And this data actually was from four totally separate studies. And I have the one by a one-to-one -one line shown in pink, just to show you what a perfect correlation between in vivo and in vitro would be. 
And actually, the gastric emptying, even though, as I mentioned to you, the way that we're emptying digesta from the HGS does not separate out solids and liquids. It doesn't differentiate kilocalories per minute or nutrients per minute. It really just empties whole digesta. It actually does a pretty good job of mimicking what's happening in our growing pig model, at least compared to the dry matter emptying, because for these two different meals of different breakdown rate, different structure, we actually saw a pretty similar gastric emptying rate that is pretty close to a one-to-one -one correlation. Also, if we take a look at the breakdown, because the food breakdown is actually really important and looking at the solid matrix breakdown is an area of work that's really important in my lab. We're looking at normalized hardness. So this is essentially looking at the textural properties and how they change over time, either in our in vivo digesta, so on the y-axis, versus our in vitro digesta on the x-axis. And we have white and brown rice in this case. And again, I have this one-to-one -one line shown in pink. And so that's what a perfect correlation would look like. So you can see we actually do have a pretty good correlation between our in vivo and our in vitro for a majority of our time points. But we do have a few points over on that right-hand side that kind of shift away from that trend. And those are actually at our earlier digestion times where our in vitro hasn't decreased that much yet, but they have actually broken down in vivo. And that may be due to some differences in mastication, study setup, and other factors. So one other interesting thing that I think is really cool is to take a look at the pH gradient. So in our in vivo studies, what you can see on the right-hand side of this slide is we've observed that there's a difference in pH throughout the stomach at any digestion time, where you have this higher pH in the proximal or that upper stomach versus a lower pH down in that distal stomach near the antrum. So since we've observed this in vivo in a variety of different meals, actually not just these ones shown here, we decided to investigate that in vitro in a study where we were using sweet potato chips. So although the meals are totally different, it's really interesting that we can still see a similar trend where we do see some amount of segregation within the HGS where we have a higher pH. So in our 60 minutes, you can actually see we do have a higher pH at the top of the HGS and it does decrease as it goes down and that pH becomes more homogeneous with a longer digestion time as it decreases. So it's really promising actually that we do see this similar segregation that we've seen in vivo. But as with all models, there are some limitations of the HGS, and I just want to point out a couple of them to give a fair evaluation of our model. So one of them is that our contraction depth is limited, and the way our system is set up, it actually would be quite difficult to change the depth of the contraction. Also, when I mentioned to you the system that we've set up to control the gastric secretions with an intragastric pH measurement, the locations for that measurement are somewhat limited due to the setup of the bag, that it does have this J shape. And with that curve shape, it's very hard to get a pH meter that goes across that curve, as opposed to some of the other um, really cool innovations going on in some of the dynamic models. We don't have a realistic wall material in this model. As you can see, that blue liner does not look like the actual gastric mucosa, but that's an area for future study. Similar, the gastric secretions are at the top of the reactor and not coming through the wall material. And I think developing a more realistic wall material as well as the integration of gastric secretions is an area that we could improve the HGS taking on some of the innovations that some of the other groups have done in their models. And then finally, our gastric emptying rate is again based on this total digest to emptying that actually is, seems to be pretty promising. So although I've listed this as a limitation because we can't, for example, control exactly the kilocalories emptied or exactly the starch or solids emptied, it is something that we were able to correlate to in vivo data, but could be improved if we could come up with some of these physiological control systems that are occurring in vivo that help actually modulate the emptying rate. So now I just want to give you a really brief overview of a couple of different types of research questions you can answer with the HGS. So one of them is looking at how do meal properties impact gastric transit. Now this was a really cool collaboration that we had with the University of Birmingham where we actually shipped our HGS there and used their positron emission particle tracking system to be able to trace the location of a radioactive particle as it moves throughout the HGS. To make this more relevant to realistic systems, we actually attached the particle onto a coded pharmaceutical tablet to see how it was moving. And we did this without including gastric emptying to not have too many variables in our system. With different meal properties, so as we go from something like water to a very viscous solution like a soup or xanthan gum, we do get very different average velocity of our tablet, but also a different residence time going from where you, it would come in as you ingest it down to the pylorus for it to be emptied. 
So in addition to looking at particle movement and particle transit, we've also used the HGS to, un to understand questions such as how does particle geometry influence gastric breakdown mechanisms? So in this study, we used heat set to, uh, whey protein gels of varying size and shape to try to understand the breakdown mechanisms during digestion, among other things. So in these graphs, you can see these are actually particle size distribution. So before and at different stages of digestion, we were actually able to identify different mechanisms, both fragmentation and erosion, that occur to these differently sized and shaped particles, which may be able to help in future food structuring and drug structuring uh, studies to be able to guide how we're shaping and sizing some of our matrices. We've also been able to address questions like, does breakdown during mastication influence gastric emptying and hydrolysis? We found that it was actually quite important. So we, in this case, we looked at cooked quinoa, and so we considered samples that were not masticated, so only mixed with saliva versus mincing with a meat grinder and then mixed with saliva, which interestingly, even with the way that we've done the gastric emptying in the HGS, so we're emptying that whole digesta, we're still able to see really big differences in gastric emptying between those samples with no mastication compared to the masticated samples. Similarly, and as you might expect, both the starch and protein hydrolysis were related to the particle size where those samples that were broken down had both a higher starch and protein hydrolysis. So in summary, the human gastric simulator that we have at the University of California, Davis, has many different options to control our gastric emptying, our gastric secretions, and our meal, and can be easily modified to represent different populations. So there are a lot of really great opportunities, I think, for work both within this group and collaborations with outside this group. There are promising relationships with in vivo data the HGS can be coupled with small intestinal digestion, so either using a static or a dynamic small intestinal model to be able to provide a more holistic picture of the upper GI digestion of different food and pharmaceutical materials. And finally, the HGS can be used both to answer fundamental or applied research questions, as I hope I've given you at least a little bit of an example in this presentation today. So now I have to acknowledge all of the students in my lab, all of our collaborators, uh, both at the Reddit Institute as well as the University of Birmingham who've worked with us. And with that, I thank you for your attention. But, uh, okay, thank you okay, for your uh, enthusiastic presentation and uh, uh, stating the advantages and uh, disadvantages uh, of the system. Um, First of all, I wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned that it can be adjusted for specific patient populations. Uh, how would you actually address this or which kind of uh, patient populations are you considering? So I think in terms of, and that, that was that was one slide I had more details on, but had to remove because I was given a very strict 15 minutes time limit and I was trying to stay within there, within the limit. Um, <laughs> yeah, but we have the question and, time. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Um, so I think in terms of adjustments, what I was thinking that we could be could be adjusted could be the contraction speed. If there was a different contraction speed, we could adjust easily the gastric secretions. If we were looking for, for example, patients that might be taking acid suppression medications, which include a lot of people, so we could change the gastric secretions. Also, the gastric emptying rate we could change. Um, and so that's that. That was kind of what I was thinking in in making that statement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a couple of questions related to temperature, and so mm -hmm. first uh, question is uh, related to the uh, fact whether the, the system is capable of simulating the temperature gradient of the gastric content. The temperature gradient of the gastric content. Yeah. Um, so, so in our system, we're controlling that. So we have two temperature probes, actually, one that's just in the outside of the system and one that we can put into the gastric content to make sure that our gastric content is coming up to temperature. And obviously as we're, we put the material in basically at room temperature or how you would eat it. And so there will be some time where we have a temperature gradient. We haven't tried to measure the temperature throughout the HGS as we've been, um, as we've been doing the digestions. But uh, I, I would imagine that it's somewhat similar coming up to temperature, maybe a little bit slower because we have it surrounded by air, not surrounded by like fluids as you have it in the body but I would imagine it's somewhat similar. Yeah. Uh, another question also related to the temperature, but uh, that uh, uh, temperature can be changed. Uh, and uh, uh, the person who asked the question mentioned that uh, 
I guess, to mimic other species. So, but I do not know whether this is the case. Yes. Yes, it can be changed. So we have a temperature controller. Um, we're coming from an engineering background. So my students uh, who are engineers set up a bunch of different control systems and made the microcontroller. So we essentially have a place where you can set in the dial in whatever temperature you want um, to, to some extent, and we can change the temperature. So the temperature is controlled by a heat lamp and a, uh, a heater with a fan in the back. And it can be, it, it will turn on and turn off to maintain the temperature at whatever you want. So if you wanted 39 Celsius or 35 Celsius instead of 37, you could easily change that. Yeah, and a question linked to this uh, uh, positioning is the fact that uh, if you say, okay, you want to do it for uh, uh, mimicking other species, uh, whether the, the positioning of uh, the present, uh, the stomach in this system is representative for the more horizontal position in, uh, for instance, mini pigs or dogs? That's a good question. Um, although I don't think it's necessarily representative of the way that the stomach would be in some of those species where it's sitting more, instead of sitting like this, it's sitting more like this. Um, however, we've still seen, I think I showed a few examples, we've still seen uh, similarities between growing pigs and using our model. So even though the anatomical uh, representation isn't exactly the same, I think it's close enough at least to get a pretty good estimation depending on uh, what you're what you're looking to get. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we have uh, another question from uh, George uh, Van Aken. Patrick, we might might finish here because we are over time and we have one last. Uh, talk and that is a little bit longer. Uh, so Gail, would you mind uh, answering the last question and uh, type the last question or the la type the sure. last answer, please? Yeah. Sure, no problem. Okay, okay so thank you for joining us, uh, Gail. I know it's early in the morning there. Um, so we move on to our very last speaker from Canada, Yves Arcan, uh, and he, his talk is on the dynamic simulator and it's a pre-recorded talk and uh, Eve will join us straight afterwards. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are on this planet. My name is Eva Kian, research scientist working for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada at the Sintiacent R&D Center. For the next 15 minutes, I'll be presenting the AFC's in vitro digestion platform. The center was created in 1987. We are currently 62 scientific employees on staff, plus many students. We are divided into three administrative groups, the food attribute and physical chemistry of food group, the food microbiology and food safety group, and the food processing, food digestion, and food value chain group. This last one being responsible for food digestion R&D. We have developed since 2003, an in vitro digestion platform. The platform contains four main equipment. The EVGIS for in vitro digestion system is a fully dynamic computerized in vitro stomach and duodenum system. The MASTIC is an apparatus to prepare realistic food boluses. And the S EVGIS is for, for simplified EVGIS or semi dynamic, mostly manual in vitro stomach plus a small intestine system. Finally, the PBI Plus, which is prebiotic index apparatus adapted from Gibson to study microflora variation in the large intestine, to which we add, for comparison, InfoGES 1.0 and modified semi-dynamic model based on InfoGES 1.0. I'll talk about that later. This platform was used to train numerous undergraduate and graduate students and few postdocs from Europe, as well as North and South America in the last 15 years. All of our postdocs are now working in the fields. Our latest one has joined Dr. McKee's group a few years ago. The general specification of the platform are listed here. The main objective is to reproduce as closely as possible the human upper GI system while being 100% adaptable to newer in vivo information and fully automated to improve its reproducibility. Contrary to static in vitro system, our system is a dynamic sequence of unit operations driven by one, all entries 
food, drink, and enzymatic solution. Two, it's contact time. Three, mixing mode. Four, environmental condition being temperature, pH, and redox potential. All of these being free to vary all over the digestion period. Each element of the platform have its own specs. For the masticator, it means more realistic food boluses, multi-service of solid and liquid meals, up to five services each. The dynamic stomach to ileum system still has a multi-service feeding profile, now has different mixing equipment to get accurate food test restoration. As more enzymes profile, as better pH, redox, and temperature control, as adaptable transit time, liquid phase being shorter than solid phase in stomach. Now, as an emulsion of lipid subunit prior to the bile injection, now monitors the addition of brush border membrane enzyme, different composition for jejunum and ileum. For the new EVDS microbio equipment, it adds a specific microbiota in the jejunum, ileum, ascending column, and transverse column subunits. Also add absorption units specific to each subunits. There are some results from 76 projects we had between 2007 and 2019 using the old EVZIP. Here you have a project studying the release of omega-3 fatty acid in the gut while using different processing parameters. We can see the result of the mastication of the pasta. Uh, figure one. Effect of the uh, type of dye and drying temperature, 30 minutes at high versus 120 minutes at low temperature, figure two. For pastas with 15 and 30% flaxseed, figure three. Here we have a company asking if their consumers should take their probiotics before, during, or after a meal. The result is take it before a meal for best results. Here, the same company asked us to check if there is a difference in probiotic survival when taken with water, orange juice, milk, and oatmeal gruel. The result is take it with milk or any buffered food during a meal. This study compares the EVDS and the simple, uh, simplified EVDS for the survival of probiotics sporulating bacteria. The S EVDS shows slightly lower counts due to the design of the experiment, but trends with uh, sporulating bacterium are again similar. Pharmaceutical uh, company asked us to check the survival yield of the product if given as is or encapsulated with and without yogurt. We compare the standard USP protocol to the SEVDS protocol. The result shows positive result with the SEVDS protocol compared to the USP protocol. Here is an internal study we did using a literature to see if what is the effect of the meal volume and of this caloric density of the transit time in the stomach. It helps us to determine the correct transit time in the stomach to develop stomach emptying profile. It is an example of the use of the future database. Over the years, we realized the limitation of the platform's first generation. In July of 2020, we got some money to build a second platform to be completed by the end of this year. The platform will be located in, the, in a new lab. The lab expertise will, of course, involve the InfoGest 2.0 model as well as our modified InfoGest 2.0 model. In our modified InfoGest model, all is identical to the original except that we have three pHs step in the stomach. We are also adding to our platform an integrated profile and digestion database to do meta-analysis on all profiles and digestion done. This forced us to upgrade to our equipment, uh, Mastic 2022 and Evidis 2022. We also added another model of the genome to transverse column involving microbiota and absorption modules, each element of the platform add new spec. 
for the masticator, it means more realistic food boluses, multi-service of solid and liquid meals, up to five services each, communication with the new database. The dynamic stomach to helium system still has a multi-service feeding profile, now has different mixing equipment to get accurate food distribution. We have four different equipment, uh, three different equipment. Uh, as more as enzyme profile and as better pH redox and temperature control and as adaptable transit times liquid phase being shorter than solid phase in stomach. Now as an emulsion of liquid subunits prior to the bile injection. Now monitors the addition of brush border membrane enzyme, different composition in genome and ileum communication with the new database also. For the new EVDS microbiohuffin, develop a new equipment involving the jejunum, ileum, ascending column, and transverse column subunits. Add a specific microbiota specific to each subunit. Also add absorption reactor specific to each subunit and communication with the new database. The platform can now work using static, semi-dynamic, and fully dynamic systems. How does the masticator works? The general idea is to prepare the meal as you will see, uh, as, as you will see it on your plate, pre-cut to bite size. To feed the masticator module using the same feeding pattern as done in vivo, meaning same bite size, same frequency, same element patterns as the person we want to mimic. The computer controls the grinding process and adds an appropriate saliva solution according to the computerized protocols. Finally, the grounded material is molded into to generate the food bolus in an adequate texture of an adequate texture. Uh, we can alter the final product food boluses by varying the design of the, uh, of the stator, the screw, the internal cutter, and the die, the RPM of the screw, the feeding rate of the meal and of the salivite uh, solution, the pressure put on the pestle, uh, and the method used to generate the food bolus from form and size of mold, compression rate, liquid extracted. Why do we take such care in preparing the food boluses. Food digestion is the result of numerous chemical and biochemical reactions, dynamically occurring in the stomach and duodenum, in fact, in the entire GI tract. To get the proper reaction rates in the duodenum, the shine entering it should be similar to what is exiting the human stomach. That's for sure. The same holds with gastric reaction. That's why feeding the stomach with something resembling an in vivo food bolus is critical. Our food bolus preparation module is quite simple. We adapt to the commercial meat grinder to control important parameters. We test different condition until the panel of tasters likes to swallow it without chewing for sure. Those conditions are stored in profiles as a computer as the computer assures repeatability. As you can see, it is not the most sophisticated equipment, but if panel of tasters say it is swallowable when it should be, then it should be close enough to reality, at least better than those who homogenize the food prior to digestion. The strength of the masticator unit is we use different stators, screws, inner knives, and perforated plates for flexibility. We use pestle with predefined weight to improve repeatability. We can be temp it can be temperature control. The bite size and rate is adjust are adjustable. The worn screw speed is adjustable. The saliva flow is adjustable too. The weaknesses of the domesticator units, it's not fully automated, requires a somewhat large sample because of losses at beginning and end of mastication. The second main unit of the platform is called the EVGIS 2022. It is based on the previous version, so we still have a multi uh, 
service feeding profile for solid and liquid services, improve the mixing in the stomach. We have three different types of mixing. Upgraded the, to 10 separate enzymatic solutions, improve our pH redox and temperature control, differentiate the solid and liquid transit time in the stomach, added an emulsion subunit prior to bile injection, and added brush border membrane enzyme to the digestion past the duodenum. Here you have a schematic of the latest version of the images. We see the stomach where the beverages, meals, and numerous enzymatic solutions enters. The stomach is a thermostated vessel where temperature, pH, redox potential, and mixing are computer control using profiles mimicking the in vivo conditions. The proximal portion of the duodenum is also a thermostated vessel having its own uh, enzymatic solution and environmental profile. The distal duodenum, which is a tube in a water bath, with a simple way of mimicking the peristaltic mixing and movement using static contriction. And finally, the jejunum and ileum in a second water bath. For the EVGS 2022 unit, this trend is multi-service feeding profile and variable meal volumes, <laughs> adequate mixing distribution, up to 10 types of enzyme cofactors, pH, redox, and temperature fully adjustable through profiles. Transit times, liquid phase different from solid phase, based on caloric load. Presence of brush border enzyme and emulsion of lipid in pylora and duodenum. The weaknesses are need more validation, for sure. Texture of food, for example, corn envelope may stay too long in stomach and may clog some tubes. No microbiota and no absorption of bioactive. The current challenges of the EVGIS 2022 model lie in the development of a jejunum and ileum portion, including brush water enzymes, selective absorption, accurate microbio microflora uh, specific to each section and cell culture to include specific in vivo conditions. That is why we have developed the EVGIS microbiome. We see here a schematic of a six modules unit. Each module is made of a main reactor at the bottom containing free and attached specific microbiota. The two reactors at the top are used for selective absorption using materials similar to the static phase inside GC or HPLC column. Yep. Each module can be used independently or can be chained similar to the Shine model to mimic different parts of the small and large intestine except the descending column. The first module is fed with a duodenal effluent, either synthetic or coming from the EVSIS 2022 effluent. And finally, for the, 20, uh, for the EVGIS microbiome, the strength are, is compatible with EVGIS effluents, its pH, redox, and temperature control, also true profiles. It's a transit time compatible is with EVGIS and fully variable throughout a time or a different section of intestine. Brush border enzymes is that both attached and free. And also, we take into account the absorption of bioactive. The weaknesses is we need more validation. And also, the texture of food, the tubing limitation. Composition of absorption material to be defined, and unit does not include the descending column. The sum of the strength and weaknesses of the new platform. On the positive side, the platform is available to almost any human and food. Platform can process real meal of different sizes and composition. Main equipment are extensively automated for repeatability and all profiles and results are saved in a database for future data mining. On the negative side, the masticator is not fully integrated with the EVSIS. It means the amylase can work longer in an in, in vitro digestion than in in vivo digestion. The EVSIS is not fully integrated with the EVSIS microbiome. The 2022 system is brand new. It may not work as expected, although we have tested many prototypes. 
more validation is needed using different human models, different foods, and different profiles. And there's not enough data in literature to build profile with confidence. In conclusion, with the in vitro digestion platform is made of three main equipment. The Evisys and Masticator unit is one of the few models focused in the dynamic on the dynamic of food destruction. Destructuration. It is very flexible and real. Uh, Multi-service meal can be fed as real as in real life. Same feeding pattern, same gulp, and, uh, bite size, texture, and frequency can be adapted to different subjects baby, child, adult, eating habits, digestion pathologies. But this model cannot study the effect of different factors on any variable for which we have made a profile. For example, what happens to the pH when we take an antiacid? The Evisys microbio unit can be used to study the evolution of fecal microflora, but bottles is in its infancy still in development. If needed, the whole platform can be adapted to monogastric animal digestion. Thank you for watching. I'm waiting for your questions. Thank you very much, Eve, for this very impressive talk. Uh, a lot of models available uh, in your platforms. Uh, covering the whole gastrointestinal tract. So I think that we can discuss your your different models for hours. But André so, told me that we have time only for one quick question. So <laughs> um, the question is from George von Aken, which uh, it's on the masticator, masticator uh, which parameters criteria are used for the program to decide that the bolus can be swallowed? Is that the particular size, the particle shape, the viscosity of the bolus, or the lubricity of the bolus or any other parameter? I would say all of the above. Like I said in the, in the talk, uh, we, we generally what we do, we uh, masticate it. And after that, we put, uh, I swallow it. And if I can swallow it easily without chewing, it would be okay. 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 Very pragmatic. Thank you. André? And on time as well. Okay, so Honest. I just have a... a, a <laughs> two three three slides that i want to share with all of you um can you see my my screen yep yeah okay so uh, after all these sophisticated dynamic models i just want to show you a, a simplified version we call it a semi-dynamic uh, uh digestion model it's based on an international consensus again uh and here you can see uh, uh, the equipment is all lab equipment that is uh, commercially available, relatively uh, low cost and reproducible and based on an international consensus. I just put the QR code up here. Um, the InfoGest is a very open uh, organization, same as, same as UNGAP. We do have um, a relatively easy tool. Obviously, you can uh, go to the website and join InfoGest, but another one would be LinkedIn. So you just go to LinkedIn, look for InfoGest and follow. At the moment, we have 1,111 uh, followers and we post, uh, you know, it's relatively easy to post uh, news or webinars. This is probably the last webinar for a while. We uh, uh, probably have to change the format a little bit. Uh, and whenever you have some some kind of news, even if you are on UNGAP, if you add um, at InfoGest, so the at InfoGest, these 1,100 uh, people will actually get that as a notification. So it's a very easy way of uh, uh, sharing information. Of course, in one month's time, we have the Food Digestion Conference right here in Cork, so 3rd to 5th of May with some working group meetings that Didier mentioned um, earlier. So we'll be a, a terrific event, uh, very good speakers. And I think that's all I have to say. So if everyone could switch on their camera, whoever is left here, I think it was a terrific event. And in, in that event, uh, I don't think we could have get, got everyone together in one room. Uh, we saved thousands and thousands of air miles, tons of CO2, uh, even though <laughs> most of us are pretty uh, tired of webinars. I think we had over 250 people at some stage, and we will, I already got some uh, emails from New Zealand. They would like to see it uh, afterwards on, on YouTube. So it's a nice 
good tool and I'm planning to leave that on YouTube for eternity. I don't know, for the foreseeable future anyway. Okay, Peter, I hand over to you. Well, I have nothing to add. Thank you to all the speakers. It was very interesting. I learned a lot. So hope to see you uh, all in Cork if, if you can make it. Very good. Patrick, do you want to say something else? Nothing to add. So thank all the speakers and I think uh, they turned it into a great event. So. Excellent, excellent. So we still have a few people there online. I think we uh, we finished soon. I'm changed here for, for sport already. I have to have my 10,000 uh, steps uh, in there because four hours was a little bit too ambitious, I think. I think there was a longer than a marathon. It was a little bit too long for us, but I think uh, uh, well worth it. Okay, very good. Thank you all. Okay, bye. bye.